opened their big mouths and out came talk. Talk, talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Precisely>. yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't seen that movie. That was news to me when you asked me to pull that clip. Um, that is one of my all-time favorite movies, and you sh absolutely should watch it. And um, I don't know. It's just one of those just like all time great flicks actually it's really funny there was um i'm just trying to get it's it's the malcontents folks always screwing around with crap at the last minute trying to make it look <laughs> and it's not cooperating as usual um okay it's um, very one brand for us uh uh uh, uh. I used to watch it all the time at the uh, at the uh, at the New Beverly Theater on uh, Melrose, where they played all those vintage movies. You know, oh, okay, revival movies. When, and, when uh, is that like early fifties ish? Uh, what is the year of? Uh, I think it's yeah. I'm gonna look it up. Okay, I was all right. I, was, I was going I'm to thinking, look it up. I'm thinking, oh hey, hey, there's there's people showing up. We got a Jeremy, we got a Wayne, and we got a Steven. What's up, dudes? Oh my gosh. We have uh oh, we have uh Wayne being flattering. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Jeremy's 1950. firing questions off. 1950? 1950. Uh Starring well, Gloria, Gloria, Gloria Swanson. I think I said 1950. Yeah, you <laughs> said 1950. Early. Wow. Uh, the main characters are uh, Gloria Swanson and uh, Joe Gillis, uh, who's uh, a, a failed budding screenwriter, and uh, <clears throat> it's like it's like the mother of all uh, coyote, not coyote. Um, a cougar movies. Uh, oh, okay. That so, theme. so aged at the end of her career, Gloria Swanson plays an aged at the end of her career, Norma Desmond, <laughs> who's <laughs> who uh, who Norma Desmond in the movie is um, a, a fading silent film star. And uh, <clears throat> she's holed up in this mansion in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. She uh -huh. hasn't been out in decades. She's uh -huh. rich. She owns a I quarter think I know of the story, actually. She owns a quarter of the downtown real estate in Los Angeles, which in real life, Gloria Swanson owed, owned real estate in right down in the financial district of Los, downtown Los Angeles. Okay. So she's basically put they put it gave her a different name, but she's basically playing herself. Yeah, yeah. And uh <clears throat> and uh Otto Preminger actually plays Otto Preminger. And <laughs> um and he's kind of acting as her caretaker. She's trying to get back into films, but she wants it her way. She wants to have a new film and revitalize her career. And okay. it's gonna, and it has, to, but it's going to be a silent film. Yeah. And so for you, for those of you who just jumped in, play play that little intro clip again. Certainly. Uh, come on, rewind machine. So they opened their big mouths, and out came talk, talk, talk. So she's explaining to the to this uh, the guy that who's gonna, she wants to write the screenplay for her new film you know how movies have gone downhill because people are talking and uh, <laughs> so well, that's what that was about yeah it's a miracle. And, and that's that was the inspiration for using it as the opening clip for our show you know um one of my really good friends um was telling me that when he first got to LA he's he's uh from France, actually, 
Um, his first gig in town was being the personal driver to someone who, an actress who had been big in that era. Uh -huh. And um, she had also been married to um, a, a renowned actor. Of course, I forget all of their names at this point, but um, when she, I mean, she was in her eighties when, mm -hmm. when Trump was driving her around and, and kind of being her personal assistant. And, um, but she gave him a nice chunk of money when she passed really sweet thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it reminds me of that story. Um, uh, so we're, we already got some cool questions here, but let, let's. Yeah, quick, quick, this one. quick one. I, what, I was really into th these revival movies. Me and my friends all went to these revival movies. And one of the girls in this group of people managed to get Ida Lupino's phone number. <laughs> and by that time, Ida Lupino was just this reclusive drunk. Okay. So this girl would call up Ida Lupino at like all hours of the morning. And of course, Ida Lupino was like, a, a, a you know, a, ma a bombshell mm -hmm. in her day. And, mm -hmm. uh, but she's like, who's going? What do you want? Ah! <laughs> and but she would actually pick up. But the girl, but the girl was really a big fan and she just wanted to talk to Ida Lupino. I just called it to say hi. <laughs> no, no, no bother me. You know, you call and say hi at four o'clock in the morning. You know, I mean, she, the girl was clueless, but she was. Oh, I just want to call. Her. Wait a minute, you only want to call Ida Lupino when you're drunk, and you're sure that she's going to be awake at four o'clock in the morning and drunk, and it's just going to abuse you for being such a rude little. It, 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 yeah, that was an interesting group. Okay, first of all, the first and most important question. <sighs> oh, oh yeah. Ocean. What are we drinking? Okay. Yeah, this, I, can, I can match you there. Yeah, this 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 is aged on ships that travel around the ocean. So, uh, are you? So, yeah, me? maybe kind of gimmicky, but it tastes great. That's you super actually, gimmicky. you actually came over last week and had some. So, you being the expert, you can tell me if it's legit. no. I didn't have any of that. You didn't? No, I just looked at the bottle. What's the matter with you? I thought you tasted it. No, it was midday and we had to work, dude. Oh, that. <laughs> uh, well, what I got going on is uh, this is interesting because it's a Lefroy 10 year, um, which if anybody's familiar with Lefroy knows what I'm talking about. But this one uh, is finished in sherry oak casks, which is not the typical Lefroy experience. Hmm. Um, and I'd never had this expression before. <clears throat> but um it's also uh, bottled at forty-eight uh, percent ABV, which is higher than the the standard ten year. The standard ten year, I think, is forty-three. And ABV stands for what? Uh, alcohol by volume. Oh, oh, oh. So, you had to you had to you had, you had to make it more complicated than it was. ABV. So it's it's getting it's getting close. It's almost fifty percent, which would qualify it as cask strength. Hmm. But um, the the weird thing about it is it being a ten year old. Um, it doesn't taste like a 10 year old. It has a bite and kind of, uh, the, my first thought was, whoa, this is a young whiskey. It's, it's kind of angry and pissed like a younger expression would be, but it says it's 10 years. So I don't know. I don't know. I got to call John Campbell and, and ask him. He's the head distiller at Lefroy. Oh, well, you just call him personally. In fact, let's call him right now. You got, I actually, I actually have a picture of, of, Oh, I thought you were going to say was, you had his number. We should just give him I don't have his number, but I have talked to him. Um, Lefroy, the, uh, this is so nerdy. Uh, <laughs> there, there's this thing. If you're into Lefroy, <laughs> I'm a friend of Lefroy. All right. Means when, when he comes to, uh, to the U.S., they'll do these tasting events in uh. major cities of the country. And um, – the last time that he came through LA, I, I was there and I got, and he's a really great guy. And uh, what a, yeah, see, Tyler knows. Yep. The John Campbell, wonderful, wonderful guy. And uh, one of my <laughs> absolute favorite whiskeys. So handsome that's what we're drinking. Yourself. Handsome devil yourself, Wayne. <laughs> You're quite the catch. And your wife, of course, is quite the beauty. And she just had a birthday, right? Or was it an anniversary? It was something to be celebratory about. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, we took care of Jeremy. Uh, Misa Powell says, good evening. 
And uh, yes, BJ, you've been very patient. What the hell do you want us to talk about? The story of Fanes, the details of cab formation. Cab formation. Love hearing the insight that's been brewing. The story of Fanes. Um, okay. I'm drinking a four-day vintage Pepsi. Oh, I like that. A four-day vintage Pepsi. What, it's been sitting out on a counter for four <laughs> days, and it's got, like, what flies in it, and uh, a paraben-free plastic bottle. Well, okay. <laughs> that's, so that's the good stuff. 53, you're a baby. Or is she 53? You're still a baby. <laughs> uh, Tyler? I always want to do this thing. I'm going to do it eventually. I'm going to find in Seattle, uh, maybe she was national, but in Seattle we had a children's show uh, oh. called Romper Room. And uh, and the, the host of Romper Room, this woman, it was like a little kid's classroom, and she had the magic mirror, which mm-hmm. she held up. And it had, you know, like rhinestones on it. It was a round mirror with a handle and it had rhinestones Something covering had to make the mirror part. Nice. And she would make this, hold this mirror and go like this and sing and sing or, or, or say this little chant. Mirror, mirror, blah, 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 blah. And then magically the mirror would go transparent. She'd look through it. And then she would go, I see Bobby, and I see Jimmy, and I see Karen, and I see, oh, it's Bobby's birthday. And I'm gonna I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a romper room mirror next time, and I'm gonna do the whole romper. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna learn the little mirror chant, and I'm gonna do the whole routine. So stay tuned for that. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, so I guess it's if, if you have a birthday, send in your birthday requests. Yeah, exactly. And, and you'll get a magic mirror right. moment. A magic mirror malt moment. Courtesy of the malcontents. Hey, Ryan, pull my finger. I mean, follow my finger. Uh, and then, yes, we'll get to that. Um, what What is this thing? Uh, Jeremy had this question um, at the beginning about um, amp standby. Bu- uh, CS Guitars creators saying that amp standby button does nothing. It is only there to appease musicians. Yeah, sad but true. Ah, okay. Well, we're out. I, 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 I defer to whoever CS Guitars is. Okay, CS Guitars, aren't they in upstate New York? Is that correct? Oh, is it them? Is it Craig? That CS Guitars? Probably. Um, I don't know another CS Guitars. Okay, like every myth. Let's go back cuz this is related. Let's go back to the 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 uh the the image for the show. The intro card for this episode. Hmm. You know what? We don't have a video of that, so I can I don't think I can put that up. Okay. Well, the uh the the placeholder card. Yeah. For this show is got the Mohawk guy Doing a windmill swing on a flying V. Uh, man, this okay. is yeah, yeah. There hard. we are. That is Ilroy. <laughs> uh, th- those of you who go way, way back with us know that Ilroy was the punk rocker who was crouching down, squatting with his pants around his knees, and uh, and he was. He was silk screened on the circuit boards of our first amps. And Ilroy is my alter ego. He's the he's the freak that lives inside here that makes me say and do things that I probably shouldn't say and do sometimes. But say la vie. Uh, <clears throat> and I had envisioned Actually, I created him because I wanted to do something called Ilroy Says. And actually, Ilroy was taken from Kilroy. Remember the Kilroy was here with the big yeah, guy yeah, yeah. taking over the – that was like a 50, 60 thing. Il, Kilroy was here. Yeah. Walking around corners and stuff. Well, when uh, 
when the BC Boys came out and with uh, License to Ill, was it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the I thought, yeah. and I was trying to think of a name for this character, and I thought, Ilroy, Kilroy, Ilroy. Ilroy has a license to ill and he'll be the character. And now it would be, uh, it would be an anonymous person uh, posting a, a, an online blog to dis disabuse people of these crazy rumors and non facts and things like that, that just sort of bug me and think, why do people say stuff like that? Well, because they don't really understand the foundation of the conversation in the first place, because there's no context. It's not that you're dumb. No, uh, no, no. It's simply that a lot of these things are said without a scintilla of context. A lot of like quotes you see in the media every day today. Uh, people read something, get all riled up about it. There's no context. If you actually went and read the whole article in which this phrase was pulled out and made, made click worthy, you'd find out that the story that you were led to believe from the quote is probably 180 degrees opposite of the story once read in context. And all this stuff about electronics and the way amplifiers work and bias and cone cry and just about anything that you can mention is so far out of context. And now it's canon out of context, mm -hmm. which means it's been repeated so many times that there isn't any way me or Ilroy or anybody else are going to undo years and years of the regurgitation of contact free non facts about amplifiers. So, uh, uh, that my, that's my, th those are my thoughts about the subject of the standby button doing the standby switch doing nothing. And I don't want to get too deep into the reality because there is a lot of context wrapped around it that will help you digest it better. And we'll, you know, we might get to that eventually. I, I, we want to get on to some other stuff that we have been promising you guys to get to over the last couple episodes and haven't. So we want to make sure that we cover that, but just the bottom line is, what is the what is valid about having a standby switch? Really, these days or any days, it's mostly about just having your amp use less energy if you're not playing through it. It's not whether the caps last longer or do the tubes fail sooner or any of that stuff. It's just a convenience. Mm. Um, now, uh, We've made uh, the couple of combos, the Sound City 20 and Sound City 30 combos, and they don't have to switches. Right, right. Uh, so there's a lot there's a lot wrapped around that. For example, the SC30 has a tube rectifier. Well, the tube rectifier takes a more time to warm up the filament, takes more time to heat up than the filaments in the power tubes. So on a really super nerdy techno level, when plate voltage is applied to a power tube or even a preamp tube, but it's more relevant to power tubes, before the filament heats up, it can cause what's called cathode stripping, which is the, the, the element, the material that the cathode is made of can lose some of its ability to perform over time as a result of that. However, it's just such a minuscule amount of that and it requires so much stripping before it really in, in impacts the performance of the tube. It's almost not even worth talking about. It's it like really that thing about, about, you know, if you eat too many carrots, your skin will turn orange. Exactly. It's and like, you know how many carrots you'd have to eat? Yeah, skin turn buckets orange? and barrels and, and and it all, goes back to the, it, it all goes back to the advent of vacuum tubes when they were when they were new and when they were unrefined and when they, there was a lot of development left to be done and and the cathode materials were improved and manufacturing processes were improved and largely made some of these ideas irrelevant or or in, in inconsequential to the point of being irrelevant so uh, that what that does is it leaves it up to you guys to decide 
do you think it's convenient or not? Do I want to use a standby switch or don't I? Do I think it makes a difference or don't I? You know, I mean, you can just treat it that way. But as far as the, really the performance of the tube, the Sound City 30 has a tube rectifier. So the tube, the rectifier in the tube, in the rectifier, the filament in the rectifier tube heats up slower than the rectifier, the filaments in the power tubes. So the power amp tubes get up to temperature before they start receiving voltage from the rectifier tube because the rectifier tube is warming up slower than the power tubes. Mm -hmm. So they finally get to the right temperature. So it doesn't really cause any, uh, any impact there. Now with solid state rectifiers and you have a standby switch, then when you throw the standby switch, uh, wow, hey, you're just throwing current right at the tubes and, mm -hmm. and that's gonna damage the tubes. No. Hmm. What's going to happen when you turn the standby switch on is then the high voltage power supply is going to begin to charge because there's no voltage in the power supply. And if there's no voltage in the power supply, there is no voltage at the tube or there's no operational parameter of the tube that can really be impacted by a sudden inrush of voltage. The sudden inrush of voltage and current are being absorbed by the filter capacitors because they're charging up quickly. So there's a little surge there. Again, it's pretty inconsequential. So it's that's more, interesting. That's interesting. I kind of look at it. I always felt like, um, you know, like on a gig, you fire up your amp. It's on standby. In between sets, you turn it on standby. So the things sort of stay warm because I'm thinking of it almost like, uh, you know, the model of, um, you know, being an athlete. You want to keep your muscles warm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everything's still ready to go, you know? You're not well, there's definitely cold. there's definitely something to keeping the amp warm, because okay. because um, the uh, the mainly because of the power transformer, the oh. power transformer warms up as you're playing the amp, and as it warms up, the copper wire heats up, and as the copper wire heats up, it's resistance. Excuse me. Its internal resistance goes up, and that means the voltage coming out of the transformer goes down a little bit. Now we're talking tens of volts, maybe okay, five, five to tens of volts out of four hundred fifty. But it does cause the transformer to sag a little bit after it warms up, huh? And that's why tube amps sound better after a half an hour because they're right. getting gushy. Okay. The the shock absorbers are warming up, so they're they're not they're not as stiff, right? Okay, so and, I'm not uh, so there, is, wrong. there is merit to having the keeping the power transformer warmed up in, in between sets. And if you have uh, if you have an amp that doesn't have a standby switch, and you take go take a half hour break, you come back. If it's a cathode biased amp, that baby is hot when you come back. So. In a situation like that, if you're going to take a 10 minute break, you just leave it running because you're going to bang on the thing for four sets a night anyway, and mm -hmm. it's going to get really hot no matter what. So that's kind of inconsequential. But if you're going to play for an hour and then take off for an hour and you got a standby switch, yeah, put standby switch on. It keeps it warm, doesn't hurt anything, and runs longer. All right. I went way longer than I intended. Oh, that's that's BMO, Ardbeg Wee Beastie. I know that bottle. That's like, that's the five-year-old, right? Uh, I had a bottle of that and it was pretty good. Um, I'm telling you guys, this sherry finish Lafroy is kind of weird. I don't know how much I'm digging it. The finish <laughs> is really kind of, you, you, you get the, it's like the tannins in the wood, but it's it's kind of bitter and strange. Hmm. Be, probably, I think it's a newer expression, so I doubt any of you guys have tried it out, but. Um, well, I, uh, there's kind of a, there's kind of a, a trend, you know. I mean, there's the the five year island. Yeah, there's right. the the uh, the, uh, the Cabernet aged in bourbon barrels and blah blah blah. And I've tried it. Yes. Yeah, there's a little bit of that thing in there. Do you want a steady diet of it? Probably not. Well, you know, kind of the the thing that they're doing in in the whiskey world now is, you know, they'll most of these things will sit in the casks for. You know, like this is saying it's a 10 year and then they'll jam it in these smaller um, like quarter casks for, 
maybe six months to kind of impart a little bit of, you know, a different kind of edge to it in the end. Um, and, you know, it's kind of cool, but it's not like a uh, oh, tangy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the wee beastie. Yeah, that's hey, good. It's uh, super Bebo, young. Hey, Bebo, correction. Doobie. Not good be. Do be a don't be. It's do be a do be. Don't be a don't be. That was, he's like quoting Romper Room. They had a little song. Do be a do be. Don't be a don't be. And he said, do be a good be. It's it's do be and don't be. You See, I, have, do I don't be. even know. I, I ate dinner 20 minutes ago and I don't know what I had. But I definitely remember the, the song when I was five years old that they were singing. Hey, uh, what, what's the GPI, GPDI into the LX2? Is there a balancing act between how hard to drive the output section of the GPDI and driving the LX2? Or all just by ear? All oh, just man. by ear. Everything's by ear. And then we Steve can explain you, to you what's happening. We, we <laughs> give, all just yeah, well, actually, what we cover tonight will sort of give you some insight into that. But we're giving you a palette of flavors to play with. Uh, on the assumption that that you're the inquisitive artists and musicians that you are, and you want to explore the the, the depths of the cool gear that you're using, and uh, that that stuff is all there for for you to to uh, go and explore and and dig on and and figure out what works right for you. No. There's, 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 there's no, there's no rule book on that. The rule book is what makes you inspired to play. Yeah. What makes you well, like for the other night, I want to tell you, I spent two weeks now getting ready for this episode. Yeah. From you should probably day, talk about that. From the day, from the from the time the last episode ended till today, I have been racking myself to get the rig that I use for the stream set up the way I want it to work. And I realized, I realized yesterday that I'm doing the same thing I always do. You gave me these tools to work with, but they have all these limitations and they have all these roadblocks that you didn't tell me about. And there's all these conditions and windows and Mac and Brad up the drivers. And I'm like, screw you guys. If we did that with our amps and gave an, imagine we produce an amplifier that, that some rock star player is using and then you get it home it sounds like ass. It doesn't work. You can't figure out how to turn it on. When you do turn it on, birds come flying out of it, and you don't know what the hell's going on next. And you have to go online and search forums and look at YouTube. It's videos. cropping parts. It, yeah. It's like so out of control. <laughs> and, and uh, uh, you know, we've had some help from some manufacturers to get some of the gear together that we needed to make this happen. And... We've given shout outs to everybody and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, the stuff has to work. It has to work. It has to work for you. It has to work for me. It has to work for Joe. Uh, and um, my attitude is, oh, StreamYard. Okay, so it has, a, it has a stereo. It can process a stereo image. Great. That means I can use the left channel and the right channel. I can do blah, 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 blah. And um, I couldn't even use the rig that I had set up last time because it would not play nice with Windows. Then yeah, the drivers. It's classic. never going to play nice with Windows. And so the interface that I had at the time, after talking to people for a week about which computer I should change to, you know, I finally went, you know, screw that. I don't want to change computers. I've been using Windows for decades. Our business runs on Windows. All my design software runs on Windows. I'm not going to change my whole reality just for this interface that the company doesn't feel obligated to make it work with Windows, you know, Windows, the operating system that outnumbers Mac by 100,000 to one, you know, why do they make it work for Mac, but they don't make it 
okay, Windows are always doing different things and blah, 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 blah. There's always development. Yeah, there's always development. And you're always in always development. Cop out. That's be like me saying, yeah, well, Celestian's making their speakers now and uh, we just can't figure out how to make our amplifiers work with them. <laughs> what we, your consumer, your response to me would, Gee, what a thin-skinned jerk. I'm just going to go buy Wagner. <laughs> so I went through this, and uh, I had borrowed uh, – I don't know if any of you remember Paul Schieffer. Paul Schieffer was the, uh, our buddy who was uh, involved in the uh, the Kickstarter project and, you know, was in, when we were developing the, uh, the GPDI. He's a computer geek. He's an engineer guy. He's got all the stuff – and um, he loaned me uh, an RME, uh, Fireface interface, uh, uh, just before COVID started. And that's when I first started getting a, uh, uh, a DAW set up so that we could start communicating with people out there from, you know, from our lockdown positions and maybe produce some content and do this and that. And at, everything seemed to work fine. And then when I started getting the lay of the land, I went and bought uh, an interface that was not an RME. And I didn't, by the time I finally got that started to get set up and stuff, we're starting to open up the factory. And now I don't really have that much bandwidth to devote to it. So the interface sat there for months and months. We finally get the show off the ground and I can't use it because the vocal is coming out. All of the content coming out of my system here is coming out all garbled so yeah, all you, you stuff sound like I, a stuttering robot yeah all the stuff that i got to to make that all that happen was standing in the way so i after the last episode i ditched all that i went and got a new rme interface talked to the tech support there who actually knew what he was talking about and i asked him some questions he said you need to do this and you don't need to do that and here's why i blah 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 and i went i sent him an email i said you know Guy's name was, I think his name was Jeff. I said, Jeff, kudos, man. You're the first tech support person I have spoken to at another company that spoke to me the way I speak to my people when they ask me questions about our gear. From from actual knowledge, not just this, this you know, happy talk. Did I answer your question today? No. Well, did you have a fun day anyway? No, I didn't. I still don't know what the hell I'm trying to accomplish because I don't know how to use your gear. Well, thanks and have a good day. And like, feel free to contact us again if you have any questions. Uh, you haven't answered the first one. All right. Have a lovely day. Bye. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that you get from the phone companies. Ah, ah, ah. So I said, kudos to you, man. You actually answered my question in a concise you know, informative manner. And I really appreciate that. And he goes, wow, thanks. I haven't had anybody say that to me. I said, well, maybe you don't deal with guitar players, but, um, um, so I got that set it all up. It all seemed to be working. Paul came over and helped me set up and reroute everything so that it would work. And, you know, we were going back and forth and back and forth with the interface and with the stream yard and how to get stereo and how to get things to happen without echo. And I'm like, push, Joe says, well, you know, well, you're kind of pushing the limits of the stream, stream, stream yard technology. And it just really wasn't built for that. And Paul said the same thing. And I said, yeah, but it does those two features that I want. It should sound good. And it could process two channels of information. And mm -hmm. if it can do that, then we ought to be able to, on our end, figure out how to utilize that. And you just did, you just did that little roll eyes thing, and Paul did the same. Eh, yeah, you, you like you're asking a lot. Uh, yeah, no, I, I wasn't rolling my eyes. I was watching somebody out the window. <laughs> that's all right, but I, but I mean, that's, that's my eye roll. I just I just realized that I'm do I am doing the same thing with this stuff now that I do with everything. I go, well, this works. So ergo, this should work. And if it doesn't mm -hmm. work, there is a fix in there somewhere. And I'm going to find it if I have to drive everybody I know completely not so insane until I figure it out. Well, we figured it out. Thank you very much. Um, so like, and I keep thinking, you know, if we, if we produce amplifiers, that behave that way for people. Yeah, 
I'm trying to imagine how many amps would like end up in the bottom of the Great Lakes per every year. Because <laughs> I, I so we pulled out the well, old you, stuff. You also and had that that everything you also is had that really the the uh, the USB mixer chronicles. That was a good good time too. Yeah, the manufacturer of the soft the, the manufacturer of the mixer doesn't even write code for the driver anymore. It's only two years old. And Man. I went, okay, I'm going to crack this nut. I don't care what it takes. Anyway, we finally cracked it. Got everything all hooked up, and now I can do all of this stuff, which is, which is talk about. Well, you should show off the rig. We should show them your rig, kind of what you're using. Yeah. Go ahead. Or, or should we wait? Should you play through it and talk about what you're doing? Because well, I mean, well, you know, you got the PLIR back there. I've got, I've got the PLIR, the beta. Mm -hmm. Uh, the beta unit uh, that's uh, uh, the last one that we test and debug before we go to full production, which is uh, it's May 22nd. We said we we're going to be in production in June and we are going to be production in June. <gasps> Imagine that. Uh, I have a GPDI, which is the GPDI IR is coming next after the PLIR, but the GPDI is still the the IR version will be just like the existing one, only we'll have the IR loader in adi in addition to the analog cab sims. Analog cab sims, you guys still using analog cab sims? Yeah, we are, and we're going to talk about that later today. And uh, I've got a <clears throat> which way do I go? I have an ether here with a power station connected to it. And um, yesterday, Dave Friedman texted me. He says, I need a remote control switch for the PS100. And I didn't really read it that carefully. He said he needed a remote control bypass switch for the PS100. So end of the day, Friday, cranky me goes, the jack on the back, you put the foot switch in, that's the remote control. And I set off my snarky little reply. And then I looked at my phone and I went, oh, he said bypass remote control. So I sent him another text. Okay, I'm a dumbass. You don't have to modify the PS100 for remote control. I got a little box that'll do that. Oh, cool. When can I get one? Anytime you want. Oh, cool. That was the end of the conversation. So way back, we had come up with a way to remote switch the power station to on and off. A little simple box. One, you actually plug it into the speaker jack and uh, the power station has a safety feature. And you guys that have one know that if you unplug the speaker output while you're operating it, it will shut down into bypass mode and route the signal from your head in back into the reactive load part. To that is awesome. Your, to protect your amp and to protect the output stage of the power station. That mm -hmm. feature has always been in there. It was the very first thing that was number one list of things needed to be done in there because we knew we were going to be dealing with guys at Vintage Amps and are you going to blow my amp? No. Right, exactly. Uh, right. So we had to be really careful about that. And so that was all created to address that well when you plug the speaker plug in it and there's a sensor that's there's a there's a sensor that would be in the ring position of a tip ring sleeve jack hmm. that gets grounded with a normal tip sleeve plug uh and by grounding it that senses that you have a speaker plugged in and so it allows the amplifier to operate and allows the power station to send your amplifier signal to the speaker cabinet so we developed a little foot switch that uses a three wire cable going from the speaker jack to this box. And it breaks out that safety function into a bypass switch. That's super cool. So then it routes the speaker output through the box off to the speaker cabinet. And you got a little box that you can put on the floor to remote bypass it, which is really cool. 
because if you just with the power station two, especially when you only have one sound, okay, so you can bypass it to play clean, and then you can roll your guitar volume all the way up. And uh, I don't have this plugged into the interface, but I do have it plugged in. Do it. So, so, so this is the ether, volume. the ether into the PS2. Yeah, and I have the. Uh, I have the guitar volume just rolled down. And now I activate it. Turn the guitar volume all the way up. Hit that switch again. Let's see what it does when it's... That's what that does. Uh, and and that that goes. That's it's almost like a, a primitive uh, channel switching PS one hundred thing, without yeah. you know being accurately able to set each level. That's really cool. Yeah, well that that's what led to the PS one hundred, which because of course the complaint is, well. When you bypass it, you bypass the effects loop. Nah, that's right. So, but there's workarounds. For your clean sound, you put uh, a reverb or delay pedal in your pedal board in the front of the amp, and you have a different kind of a delay in the loop of the power station. So when you're playing really clean, it's okay to have reverb in the front of the amp because it doesn't screw up the overdrive because right. you're not overdriving. Right. So that works really well. So I'm so I'm way too lazy to do any of that. Yeah, I, I, but there are people out there that will and oh, do have right. that. You and would the have been one of them. Is, is you can put it if you rack mount the power station, you can put this little box on the back with the power station and then run it out to your speaker cabinet and you it has a switch, but along with the switch it also has a remote switch jack that you could send to whatever preamp that you're using that might have a switch interface jack to turn it on and off with a preset. Yeah. That's right. We're way ahead of you guys. Way, way, way ahead of you guys. Now, what, what did, did Friedman tell you what he wanted to use it for? No, it was enough that he could do it. Maybe for a demonstration rig or something. Huh. Because, you know, when, when you're getting, uh, when you're getting kind of granular like that, and okay, I'm gonna rack mount this thing, and I'm gonna put this like, dude, get the PS100 in half. You know, all the fine tuning controls. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of people that have the PS2. That yeah, have, that's true. That, that, that serves their purposes for like 90 percent of what they do, and it's a nice little ex inexpensive accessory to sort of address, give you well, just a little bit more flexibility. Right. Well, I have to say, you know. Uh, since I've been doing these videos, it just cracks me up how it seems like every other time we talk, there's like this other little trick that you can do with this thing. And I haven't even been doing, I haven't even been working with the PS100 very much. It's just the PS2. Yeah. So it does this and it does this and it'll squeeze yeah. your juice and it'll, you know. So you I know what it is? One thing that, one great thing about the Power Station 2 especially um, it's probably one of the most useful, powerful tech service repair accessory to slash tools on my workbench. I remember yeah. you told me that uh, the last time I was in the shop. You said, this is the most, I forget it's, the word you used. It's just, it's just a, it's just a Swiss army knife on the tech bench. Uh, for example, when you're uh, when you're testing an amplifier on your test bench, you want to have a load, a test load to run it up to full power to make sure it's putting out full power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some um, sometimes 
amplifiers act funny through a speaker load. And somebody might have a like an oscillation problem with an amplifier when you turn it up to a certain volume or run it at a certain impedance. You won't see that with a static load. You will see it with a reactive load. Mm. So the power station has the switches that set how reactive the reactive load is. And you can use that to suss out a problematic output stage in an amplifier. Wow. Because you can make it more reactive until it starts going berserk and you go, oh, there, I see it. You know, a regular tech with a regular static load would miss that and go, oh, you're crazy. There's nothing wrong with your amp. Oh, wow. Wait a There's an oscillation at this at 16 ohm impedance with a speaker that's got, that's bright on the high efficiency, you know, got a lot of sensitivity in the higher frequency department. You know, it might start to break into this sort of annoying high pitch squeal. That could happen. And you can, you can goose that out of the out of the test by using the reactive load part. So there's there's that. I use it as a power amp. I have a a test speaker, so I connect that to the power station, and I use that to test preamps with. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it to evaluate the development of the synergy modules when we do those. There's just there's just so many things that does beyond. I use it every day. I use it every single day at the shop for some testing, evaluation, or or troubleshooting function. It's just like, oh, I just plug it in and boop, boop, boop. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and you learn and you learn stuff about the gear that passes through your bench. So it's it's actually really would be really good for tech people to have those as part of their arsenal because. You pick up things that you never even picked up on before when you see more and more of that stuff happening. And, and it's, you funny, it's almost like a secondary market. If there was a way to do that, like if there was sort of a unified amp tech, anything, you know, guild, whatever, you know, that could would be kind of the, the new gear du jour for diagnostic equipment on, on amp tech benches. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, what I recommend a PS2, PS100, or LX2. If you're just running the Synergy, I would recommend the LX2 because then you're paying for pure amplifier performance. You're not paying for the reactive load stuff that, you're, that you don't use. That's an expensive group of components in the power station uh, that do that task. So you're basically buying... Uh, features that you don't use if that's your only application. So that's why I would recommend the LX2. However, uh, however, 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 what about that video I made this week? The power tube saturation loveliness. Well, take, the it, away, take it away, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like that new bonus sort of. I mean, I've had a power station since they first came out. And I had never done the, the power section rinse before. Being able to brown things out silently while I was recording. That blew have, my mind. Do you have a link down there for that video that you just did? Um, I don't. Um, I know I texted you, but I got to tell you. Mm -hmm. After you got the bugs worked out of that, mm -hmm. that <laughs> is a bitchin' video from beginning to end. Everything about it is just like right on step by step by step by step you covered everything the seamless edits and the playing at the end is just icing on the cake it's phenomenal the playing well, <laughs> that track that you played on that you played out on i'm just sitting there going well guys when when steve talks about when, when i got the bugs worked out this is kind of a funny thing um i was do, <laughs> i was doing my editing in a, a in kind of a lower resolution and then i bumped it up to 4k and I had to upload it really fast, and I didn't check the cut before I forwarded it to Steve. I said, hey, check this out. What I didn't know was when you bump the resolution up in, in a Final Cut Pro, like, I don't know why, but I'll never make this mistake again. Like, you have to watch what happens because Final Cut rearranged everything. And so I sent <laughs> Steve this cut where everything was out of sync. Like all my talking, like all the musical examples, it's like, hey, Steve, check this out. Are we close? No. 
Yeah, we're like we're, we're like close. we're like two or three days past oh. launch date of that video, and and Joe <laughs> and Joe sends me a link. Okay, it's ready, and I'm it like, just I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of five other critical things, and I'm going, oh god, I don't have time to look at this. All right, whatever. And I have a little <laughs> notepad in front of me, and I looked. I go, uh, edit, cut, edit, distortion. What the fuck is that? Did it? You're like, you're like, I, I don't think. Joe has a drug problem, but maybe he does. I just had no patience, so I just like banged out. Bang, 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 bang. Oh, and you need to say something about the impedance. Otherwise, we're going to hear about it. And Joe texts back, those are awesome suggestions. I'm going, "That you are not that happy about all those critics criticisms. No, I I actually thought it was great. Happy. You can't be that happy. I, no, sliced no, no, no. That, I sliced and diced you on that, and you come back, great, thanks. I'm like, is that guy insane? But – then you well, go back. Yeah. Then you go back and redo it, and I look at it, and it was like it was night and day. It's this seamless, complete story with narrative beginning. And I went, "Well, I, I, I think I texted you the next day." I was like, I, uh, "I hope I wasn't too hard on Joe the other day because this he just like did a stellar job of this." No, 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 not at all, man. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that I, I actually really like it when people say. Hey, this sucks. This, like, tell me what you really think, because then I know what to do. I think that that's why we get me. along, because we're both the same way. Nobody wants smoke blown up their ass. You know? No, just, just ride me and tell me, like, no, dude, do it faster. Get the, no, this sucks. Change this. I'm like, say, okay, great. Did you say ride me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a great day. If I'm, if I'm being a little goofy, I'm just having a great day. The weather is beautiful. I got my whole rig together. I hooked up all this stuff. I got to geek out to my heart's content. I cleaned up my whole area. Everything is just working perfectly. And, and, and uh, we had this amazing dinner, crab cakes, and this, this, green, this bell pepper soup. And what it, it's just been the whole day. It's just been phenomenal. So I'm in a great mood. Hey, uh, Jeremy, um, I, I, I think you're talking about the guitar that I used in that particular video. Uh, it's a Ronin Coyote. And uh, it's, I think the, the finish, it's called Western Saddle Fire Mist. Um, it's a lot of syllables for like kind of a champagne, almost a champagne sparkle, kind of like your drum kit behind you, Steve. Western Saddle Fire Mist. Fire Mist, yeah, yeah. That sounds like some new age cologne. <laughs> Dude, actually, that could double <laughs> as a fragrance. Western <laughs> Saddle Fire, it'd be a leather, a rugged leather scent. <laughs> Western Saddle Fire Mist. Uh, Tell me something me. about my GP3 that I may not know. Um, it will keep working longer than you have any right to expect. Ta-da! We made that thing 20 years ago. Do you believe it? Wow. 20 years ago. It's using a microprocessor that's obsolete now. And if it ever broke, we wouldn't, we'd have to scrounge for that microprocessor. And I don't even know if we have the programming tool to burn the chip. We might have it hidden in a box somewhere. And the software, I shouldn't be jinxing you by telling you this because. Um, yes, Wayne. Yeah, the GP3, that, that three yeah, channel. But uh, we, had, we had a couple come in for repair. Uh, in the last couple of weeks. And I'm always amazed. Yeah, I got to bring my GP3 and it stopped working. And I'm like, okay, this will be the day. This will be the day I got to tell the guy that I can't. Oh, that sucks. You know, and yeah. open it up and an LED is broken. <sighs> Some stupid thing. A connector isn't pushed all the way in the socket. I'm just, to this day, I'm blown away that how reliable that thing has been, they just don't break. And when they do stop working, it's just some cranky little mechanical sort of fit of a connector or a, some dumb little issue like that. Or, or a preamp tube just goes bad. I never had one. Uh, there's only one time. There was one time in 20 years that we had 
one with an issue that we couldn't fix. And it's not that it didn't work. Every function on it worked fine, except the fat switch. That one, when you turn it on, it would go through its 15, 15 second turn on sequence. This actually goes back to the, uh, the standby mm-hmm. conversation. Uh, but I just, it, would go, it would go through the turn on sequence. It would take 15 seconds before the high voltage was applied to the preamp tubes. And then it would go into operate mode. And when it went into operate mode, the fat switch stopped working. Because there was a there's a microprocessor in there, and then there's another chip called a gate array, which is actually a traffic controller for the data coming in and out of the microprocessor and going to all the LEDs and relays. And the the circuit that operated the fat switch inside that chip went bad. And to fix it, you would have to take this entire 40-pin surface mount chip off and put it back on and then reprogram it back in the machine. And the we were using a, uh, God, a, a, a Win 98 machine. That was a very stable Windows version, by the way. I remember. It was a Win 98 machine that that the software for it was on a floppy disk. So you'd put the floppy in the machine and send the programming code to this little converter that you plugged into. There's a six pin connector inside the GP3 that you'd plug that into. So you'd have to replace the part and then write it inside the machine, write to it, wow. burn, burn the code into it inside the wow. unit, and then it would work. But, you know, if just first of all, getting the chip and then we still have the code stored somewhere. Maybe, maybe not. We had a server crash earlier late last year and that may have disappeared. And if it didn't disappear, it's on a floppy disk somewhere. And Oh my God, you know, so somewhere. So Mm -hmm. um, the guy sent it to us. He was going to, he, he was in Australia and he bought it. in the U S and he wanted to have the seller ship it to us to service and then ship to him in Australia after it was serviced. And we, we said, everything's fine, except we can't repair the fast switch without a major overhaul. And it's probably worth, it's probably going to cost more than the thing is worth. And he went, Oh, I don't care about that. I don't really use that function anyway. So fine. So we said he was happy, but man, and and I was I would I keep thinking that when I see this stuff come back in for servicing that I'm going to go okay this is a product that we made in my tin ear period and let's just see how bad it actually sounds to me now you know and I go oh this is horrendous yeah this is absolutely horrendous I'm glad that we just don't make that anymore and then I go oh wait a minute I have the switch set the wrong way and I switch and I go holy crap this thing sounds great. I was just blown away. Well, that was like when we were talking about um, the the power amp stuff last week, and I was I asking. Was. You, I was thinking that the guy uses the amp that the guy uses the uh, the analog capsule in it all the time. He says it sounds great, mm-hmm. and I was like listening to it, going, "That sounds like ass," you know. And I had it set wrong, and then when I had it bypassed, and so when I went, "Oh, the button on the back that turns on," the, I had it bypassed. I turned it on, like that sounds really good. It's actually. It's actually the um, the base technology of the, the the topology of the analog cab sim in the GPDI. It's it's more developed now, but it was derived from that one. So I was really like, man, our new analog cab sim has come a long way from that one. And then I went, oh no, actually it hasn't. It's just it's developed and it's better and it's more adjustable. But the the basic the basic tonality of it was like, wow. Yeah, that's actually working. Hey, um, Sorry, I, I interrupted you. You were about to say. No, um, what I wanted to do, first of all, I'm looking at the comments here and, and just trying to grab more questions that we than we normally do. Um, okay, Jethro Skull, that's the coolest handle I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, 
Scott, you were saying, uh, is your question too nerdy? Is the one up here where you're asking with high wattage light bulbs being hard to get now, what can you recommend to an old tech getting back into the game as a current limiter? Current limiter. All right. So um, before that, the, the, Jeff, the Jethro Skull handle, it, mm -hmm. remind me of, it reminds me of the, um, the butthead dance. The, remember the butthead dance? The dance. The butt. I remember the cornholio thing. No, but no, that's Beavis. But Butthead had a, a dance. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Uh huh. So I would just imagine Ian Anderson doing the Butthead dance when I saw that handle. <laughs> Jethro Skull. You guys can put two and two together. That's enough said. <laughs> uh let's see. Um, about the light bulb. With high wattage light bulbs being hard to get now, what can you recommend to an old tech getting back into the game as a current limiter? A resistor would work. So what he's talking about is in the yeah. old days, one of the ways that, uh, or you could throw down and get a variac, but uh, is this uh, the, the whole thing days, where you you had the, 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 there was a real sim, dirt simple way to turn on an amp, usually a solid state amp, but you could also use it for tube amps. But we always use this trick for solid state amps, which is when when there's a problem with a solid state amp, you don't want to, and you put it on a repair bench, you don't want to turn the power on to see what it's doing, because if there's a bad transistor in there, and you turn it on. And hit it with enough, and it and it draws enough current when you first turn it on. Maybe you have one bad transistor. It could like take if it, and it had like eight or ten power transistors in it. You could take out the other eight or ten just by turning it on. Mm. So what you would do is you would put a light bulb in series with one side of the AC line, and when the power amp when the amplifier tried to draw too much current, the light bulb would light up. And absorb all the current and prevent the amp from absorbing all that current. So well, that's yeah, that's that whole trick when uh, like I don't remember exactly how it was, but one of my buddies was into changing everything in amplifiers, and when he changed the filter caps, he'd he'd do that thing. We'd have his lamp or his box built with the light yeah. bulb thing, and when you're charging stuff up, like what was it? Like when the filter caps were ready, then the light bulb was glowing or it was dead. I forget, but I just yeah, remember. Yeah. That. And when the when the capacitor is charged, then the light bulb goes off. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I yeah. And and uh, uh, and Scott, the simple answer is get a variac and put it uh, put an ammeter on it in series. So or a resistor in series with a voltmeter across the resistor, but much easier, just a decent ammeter, you know, a, a digital voltmeter that has a, a, like a 10 amp function and put that in series with a variac. And as you gradually bring the variac voltage up, you'll see if it's going to draw excessive current, you'll just see the current shoot up from, from zero to whatever, maybe the maximum that the meter reads out, or, you know, for, if it's going to draw four or five amps when you first turn it on and you don't want it to, then you gradually turn the variac on with the ammeter in series, and you'll see the the current reading on the meter go up way faster than it should. It's tricky because on an initial turn on surge, the current is going to spike and then it's going to level off. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to just sort of cast your fate to the wind and go, well, yeah, it's either going to ramp or it's not. And you have to get, you have to develop a feel for that. You turn, you turn the variac up and you see the current going up and you, you say to yourself, okay, it's got to break at a certain point. And you could do a little math. I mean, you can look at the back of the amp and see how much current it, is this maximum current draw at full power. And if you've given, if you've turned the variac up to 20 volts and it's like 50% of the way to a full current, you got a problem. If it, but you'll see it as you turn the variac up, the current reading on the meter will go up and it'll level off and drop. And then you turn the variac up a little more and then the current will go up and then it'll level off and drop. And then, you, mm. you know, so you have to have like that sort of sixth 
sense or that detective sort of feel for, you know, or the or the the uh, Las Vegas spirit. Like, yeah, it, it's it's going to drop off before I turn it high enough to where I made the repair costs higher than the cost of the unit. <laughs> Mm, mm. It's, a, it's a little bit of a gamble, but it's no more of a gamble than plugging in a light bulb. I mean, that's that's like <laughs> that's pretty damn Stone Age. I don't, yeah. I, I, I don't want to make you feel bad, but you know, I, uh, getting back in the game, get back in the game, use new gear. You know, use the instinct and the experience that you developed, you know, from your past, and apply it to new and better tools that are available, and you'll be fine. Mm. Okay, um, here's a question. Um, interesting. Is it possible to mod the PS2 for EL34s? Okay. Why? <laughs> now that wasn't the question. <laughs> well, I have to ask because that's always the question. And I already well, know. You want to elaborate? Wait, is, so if there's a yes or no, can't, is it possible? Let's start there. Everything is possible. Okay. All right. If you know anything so. about me, you know that there's not a lot that's impossible mm -hmm. within. That's why I was going to say. Within uh, the realm of, you know, things that people could normally accomplish. I mean, not outside of magic. I'm not a magician. Well, but, that's why I was going to say to this question here. Um, from okay, remember we were talking about the, the canon, the, uh, the oft- regurgitated and progressively more skewed and distorted canon that people constantly re spin and spin and spin until it doesn't mean anything anymore. So let's start with that. Just to make you happy, yes, can do it. But there's a right way and a wrong way and a good reason to do it and a not good reason to do it. So let's start with a 6L6 is like an EL34 in that it has a plate, two, three grids, and a cathode, pins on the bottom, glass, lights up when you turn it on, and it, it amplifies. How it does those things differ between the two tubes, how it behaves, and that's all down to the construction of the tube. And as a result, they have different optimum operating impedance. The 6L6 has a different optimum operating impedance than an EL34. And what I say by optimum, what I mean by optimum is, is that there is always a range in which the impedance uh, that the tube is being operated at um, results in the kind of output performance that you're looking for, whether it's lower distortion, higher output, um, you know, lower idle current. Uh, it's not as much about tone or fidelity because the tubes themselves don't really have a tone. Ah, okay. This is important because I think I'm going to be the devil's advocate guy here. I think the, you know, remember Friedman's comment about why didn't somebody make a Marshall power section as the building block for all these rack systems and power amps. Okay. So the question is, can we do an EL34 power station probably coming from the place of, can we make it sound like a Marshall? Or can we prevent the 6L6 from taking the Marshallness away from a Marshall? Oh, okay. Sure. Which is like saying, uh, hmm, never mind. <laughs> I mean, I think that's I, kind I, of. I, I I try to I try to come up with a with a ways of making a comparison so that you can understand like can I make my can I make my Stratocaster more or less polish and can I make my Les Paul more Stratish by putting mm -hmm. single coil pickups in one or humbuckers in the other and you know what that does mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it makes a Les Paul sound like a Les Paul with hum with with single coils, and it makes a Strat <laughs> sound like a Strat with humbuckers. It doesn't make a Strat sound like a Les Paul, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, and why yeah. is that? It's a construction of the neck. The fact that it's a set neck and, and not a not a uh, an, a the, where the strat is a bolt well, on. It's like damn near everything about it. Damn right? near everything. The way the bridge is mounted to the body, the electronics, the the value of the pots, the yeah. the scale length. I mean, you name it. Yeah. Everything about it is different, and changing the pickups doesn't change. Changing 10% of the guitar doesn't change 90% of its personality. Same in a tube amp. Thank you. I finally found an analogy that worked. Changing the, the, the power tubes to a different type of power tubes in the power station or any amplifier that's one type of tube used with another tube, you don't change 90% of the amplifier's personality by changing 10 or 20% of the tube's behavior. But you were on to something very important before I interrupted you, and it was saying that the tubes themselves don't have these strong characteristics. And there are or as strong a characteristic as we're normally used to ascribing to them. Right, because people ascribe to things, that, uh, ascribe uh, characteristics to tubes that just plain don't exist. And the other That's thing is, is you, ascri you ascribe... Uh, you ascribe fixed parameters to tubes that have varying, uh, a wide range of performance parameters to choose from. Hmm. And that is related to how the tube is made and how it performs at what voltages and what impedance. So when you run a tube in sort of in its optimum range, if and you look at the, um, and you look at the, the 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 curves, the operating curves of the tubes on the on the specification chart on the data sheet of a tube gives you a complete list of parameters under which that tube can operate at different voltages, at different currents, at what impedance, and uh, and at how much bias, and so on and so forth. And based on these various topologies, the tubes can do all kinds of different things. And so that's why putting EL34s in a twin doesn't make it sound like a Marshall and putting 6L6s in a Marshall doesn't make it sound like a twin. It makes it sound like a different amp, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make it sound like a twin. It makes the twin sound like a different amp, but it doesn't make it sound like a Marshall, putting EL34s into it because you didn't change any of the voltages. You didn't change the way the, the phase inverter works. You didn't change the... Uh, you changed the bias a little bit, but you didn't really change the bias range. And you didn't, of uh, most important, you didn't change the relationship of the speaker impedance to the plate's impedance. Mm. And and um, I don't know, this is kind of old school, but high impedance microphones used to be able to get like a little matching transformer that you plug into the cable to turn know. a high impedance mic into a low impedance mic. Mm -hmm. It's just a, it's math. It's a com impedance conversion device. It takes a high impedance primary and matches it to a low impedance secondary. And the, what, whatever the impedance of the, the mic is, is what determines what the impedance on the other side of the transformer is going to be. So if you have a high impedance mic, say it's a 10,000 ohm mic mm -hmm. and you want it to be, uh, a thousand ohms on the other side. Okay, that's ten to one. That's a ten to one turns ratio on the transformer. And if you want it to be, uh, if you want it to be five hundred instead of a thousand, now you've got a twenty to one turns ratio. Tubes behave the same way. They have an impedance, and it's not a set fixed impedance. It varies f under a lot of conditions. But let's just mm -hmm. say. Um, a, uh, a pair of EL34s operates at 3,500 ohms plate to plate. So you're going to have a transformer that converts 3,500 ohm primary to a 8 ohm, we'll say 8 ohm secondary. Now, uh, a 6L6 typically is 4,200 ohms plate to plate. 
So the transformer for the 6L6 is to get that 50 watts from the primary to the secondary at 8 ohms is going to have a different primary to secondary impedance ratio. And because of that, just changing the bias on the power tubes so that they don't draw too much current when you switch the tube type in that circuit isn't going to make it an EL34 amp because the impedance is still wrong. Now, I love this. <laughs> now, the more that you push the impedance of the tube down, the more cantankerous their performance becomes. They get more specific. They start to exhibit a personality. Yeah, that's when you're going to see their shortcomings. Right, and those shortcomings could be a benefit. And yeah. Leo Fender was just sort of like famous for just tweaking parameters and trying stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can run EL 34s at a lower uh, 6L 6s. You can run any power tube at a lower plate to plate impedance than is recommended for a given voltage. Mm -hmm. And its performance will become more apparent that there's that that's adding something that it's doing something besides just pure amplifying and that's when they start to sort of exhibit a, what you call a personality right it's not that the tube has a personality it's that you impose a personality on it by running it into a tighter set of performance parameters and that's tighter meaning you're getting it to give up its character yeah, that normally really shouldn't be there, but you give it a character. Yeah. Just, so, like, just like when you over inflate your tires, the character of your car is it's like a lot more sensitive. It turns faster. You feel every rock and bump in the road. Bubbles mm -hmm. feels more like a sports car. You let out some of the air, softer, smoother ride, seems more comfortable to you. A little, a little rubbery around the turns, doesn't mm -hmm. handle quite as well. Yeah. But do you say... Oh, Pirelli's are softer than Michelin's on my car because, right. because you tried the Michelin's on a cold day and the Pirelli's on a hot day. Right, right. Right. Any of those things could sort of come into play. Why am I going through all of that? Because um, one of the things that we go on and on and on about um, is – is the, the transparency and the sort of linear behavior of the power station's power stage. And that's why it's kind of irrelevant which tubes are in it. Why did we pick 6L6 then? If it's so easy to do, why didn't you just make it easiest for all, easier for all us Marshall guys to sort of mentally digest and put the stupid EL34s in there and be done with it? Well, because... At the end of the day, 6L6s are mechanically more rugged inside the construction style. They're just more, a little more bulletproof. You can throw them around. You can drop them on the floor. I mean, that especially the Russian sense. ones. The, I mean, the power station takes a lot of beating. They get shipped around. They get thrown around. They get dropped. They get mm -hmm. beat up. They run. They get run really hot. The tubes don't necessarily get really hot, but they're in a hot environment inside right. because of the... The reactor because load. of load and all that. And, uh, you know, well, geez, if it gets so hot, why don't you put a bigger fan in there? Because you'll hate the fan. <laughs> you'll bitch about the fan. You will. I guarantee you. I hear it every day. Uh, you know, it's waking the baby. Okay, don't play rock and roll next to the baby. Sorry. You need a fan or you need heat. But does the baby need to hear you wanking at 4 o'clock in the morning? No. You want to do that. Doesn't mean you should. Okay, so uh, anyway, so in order to make the EL thirty fours work optimally in the power station, you would change the output transformers to make uh, it work right. Okay, well if that's true, then why does Mesa do it, and why does so and so do it, and why does so and so do it? Why? I'll tell you why. Mesa started doing it as a selling point, as a bullet point, to convince you that you could do things on your own to personalize the amp to suit you. And you bought into that. 
so many people bought into it that they basically forced other manufacturers to go along with the story that, hey, it should have switchable tubes. Our tubes uses 6v6s, 6L6s, EL34s, KT88s, KT66s, KT77s. Uh, yeah, no. One of those tubes works optimally in that amp, and every one of the other ones is a compromise. Now, if you take an output, why don't you take an output transformer that's kind of like halfway between both? Because then neither tube will be able to operate optimally. So they will both be less than perfect. Yeah. So why don't you design the product so that no tube is perfectly right? Does that make any sense? Done to me. When we, tr we for the longest time, said we're not going to concede our engineering to public misperception. And what that means is just because you think it works, it doesn't. And we're not going to change our amps to to make you feel better about buying it because other people have a pitch that you bought into that. And so we should make the same pitch. Then, then you'll buy our amp. Right. And, right. No, if that's really why you're buying it, then you're buying it for the wrong reason anyway. And you're not going to be a long-term customer. You're eventually going to come back and go, you know, I wish it just did a little more of, mm, and that mm, is missing because you preferred to have it do well, but then you, know, you jack of all trades, master of none. That's really that's yeah. the analogy there. But then you, as the builder, also um, you know maybe your enthusiasm for showing up to work every day is slightly diminished because you know you you're pushing bullshit into the marketplace. Yeah, and you've got to talk about it, right? And it and it was such it was such a big deal in the uh, in. I mean, it got deafening around 1999, 2000, right around that whole. It just everybody was doing it mm -hmm. because everybody wanted to compete with whoever else was doing it, and that was a well, it's pretty cool app, but it wouldn't, it didn't have the via switch on it. So I, and a lot of manufacturers fell down on that. So we said, all right, let's just let's just have a look at this. Let's just say. We, we've just got our heads a little bit too tightly ensconced up our behind, and maybe we could just loosen up a little bit and try a model with the switch and see what kind of feedback we get. Mm -hmm. That was 2000. So we did a couple of models that had the uh, one that had a 6L6 EL34 switch and the other one that had a K2. Oh, you actually did do that. We did it. For one year. And you felt good about it too, didn't you? I felt good about it because exactly <laughs> what we thought would happen happened, which is yeah, my tech says it doesn't really bias properly in either position. And it just doesn't sound as good as my friends. His model was made a year before. Right, and right. It just doesn't sound as good. Why is that? Without the yeah, non-committal yeah. switch. Well, he's he's using EL34s and I'm using 6L6s in mine, and his just sounds way better. Right, put, right. And put the switch back in the EL34, which would be the stock position. Mm. Switch it back, put EL34. But I like 6L6s. Apparently, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I liked him in Mesa. Okay, in Mesa. <laughs> Guess and again. Mesa, lower plate voltage, more sag, less power supply filtering, all those things that you associate with the 6L6 aren't coming from the 6L6. They're coming from the rectifier. They're coming from the lower plate voltage. They're coming from a, 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 power, a phase inverter that's clipping too soon. Mm. And this is not... A, this is not um, it's, it's not a hit job on Randy. He oh, says... He says in their documentation on their website, uh, the you know some of the backstory of of uh, Randall Smith, white papers and and interviews and blah blah blah. One of the things we did was we made sure that the phase inverter started clipping a little bit before the power tubes to get that sort of soft, smooth transition into overdrive. Perfectly legit, not mm -hmm. my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Because I want the phase inverter to stay together. And we're going to talk about this today. I, we actually have some. Hey, let's bring them up now. There's one in there that's um, the, the power amp clipping one. 
Yeah. Um, we have the symmetrical, the symmetrical one. The symmetrical one. Yeah. Okay. So on the left, you see a sine wave. And then on the uh, to the right of the sine wave that has the gr green and yellow area, that's a clean sine wave. Now, when the sine wave increases in amplitude until it's past the point of the power supply to deliver power, that's the dotted line area. That's the point at which the tubes can no longer amplify. All they can do is, is, is uh, start compressing because the amplitude going into the tube may rise, but it can't output any more power because there's no more power supply See where it says plus VCC and minus VCC? That's the power supply. Yeah. So if the power supply is here, but the power tubes are trying to amplify here, they can't because the power supply is limiting them. Yeah. And that's the distorted signal. Now, that's not tube distortion. That's the amplifier distorting because it ran out of power. So... What Randy is saying is, well, we like that. We want it to transition into distortion and to stop amplifying more power. We want it to stop there because it sounds smoother and warmer to our ears. And we kind of like see that as sort of the, the vintage, you know. Well, that's a Mesa characteristic. That's a Mesa characteristic. Absolutely. And that's not ours. And, and, and you know, along the line, I just want to say this, like you were saying, it's not a hit on Randy. Like it goes along with that thing, you know, with, I was calling it, what did I say? The, the non-committal switch for, you know, which <laughs> tubes you're going to use. Like that goes along uh, with what we talked about in a previous episode of uh, somebody needed to do that. Yeah. It just happened to be Mesa. Yeah. Um, now, now the, uh, the classic characteristic of an amplifier that, uh, if people aren't familiar with our stuff that they would be familiar with uh, in history would be a high watt mm. in the high watt, the phase inverter actually stays symmetrical and sy by symmetrical, I mean what's happening on the top is exactly what's happening on the bottom. And we're out of the distortion region, which is represented by the, the sine wave on the left in the green and yellow mm -hmm. that think of that as the phase inverter, which is what drives the power tubes. And in a high watt, that will stay symmetrical like that past the point where the tubes are hitting the clipping. And that's what gives it its characteristic power amp, even open kind of awe sounding output transformer saturation sound, you know, output stage fatness. That's where that comes from. When you have the phase inverter clipping before the power tubes start to clip, mm -hmm. uh, you get that softer compression happening sooner. But depending on which phase inverter you're using, if the phase inverter starts clipping on the top or the bottom half of the wave before the top, then it's going asymmetrical, not symmetrical like you see in these pictures. Now pull up that the asymmetrical clipping picture. And I did not spell amplifier. <laughs> sure, you did. I ripped, it, I ripped this off of the, off of the internet just to give you some, a simple example to see what this stuff looks like, and and, and whoever created this document doesn't know how to spell amplifier. Now, this this is showing two versions of asymmetrical clipping. So, the input signal is symmetrical, but then if the phase inverter is clipping asymmetrically on the positive half, you get the middle image. And if it's clipping asymmetrical on the bottom half, you get the right image. In either case, uh, the, the, the one of the power tubes in a two tube amp, say a 50 watt amp, one of the power tubes is, is amplifying the distortion of the phase inverter more than the other power tube is. Whoa, really? Yeah. Okay. And now, now the fun stuff. <laughs> this is nuts. 
what happens in an output transformer and why an amplifier is push-pull is because it's an efficient way of operating the power tubes. Okay. Uh, so when the left power tube is amplifying, the right power tube is off. It's like a two, it's like a Harley motor. Okay. More like this. I'm trying to do a V. How about this? Okay. Perfect. So if one piston is smaller than the other piston, then one piston is going to be delivering more horsepower per cycle than the other piston. Mm -hmm. And in a push-pull amp, it's the same thing. What happens in the output transformer is the positive wave pushes power, and then the negative wave pushes power in the opposite direction in the transformer. Within the transformer, those two reverse phase and combine to double output power. Ugh. So a, a tube that can normally dissipate 25 watts, which is its maximum dissipation, uh -huh. could actually deliver a lot more power than its dissipation rating because it's resting half the time. So if a power right. tube can if a power tube can deliver 25 watts continuously, then it could deliver 50 watts in half the time. Mm -hmm. You know, during the time that it's uh, operating, because it has a period of rest for it to cool off, while the other tube does the other half of the job, mm -hmm. and in that way you double the output potential. Of the tube, and that's how you, that's how a twenty-five watt tube, uh, a power tube that dissipates twenty-five watts, can actually be used in pairs to deliver fifty watts to a load. When by themselves they could only do half of that. Right, right, right. Okay, so the thing about the thing about um, what happens inside the transformer, think of it like a humbucker pickup. One coil is is picking up. The electricity, the the signal from the strings, picking up the vibration from the strings, cutting the magnetic lines of force in the pickup, and the other one is also doing that, but the opposite direction. And then you flip the two pickups and wire them in parallel, and they both contribute to the output of the pickup, and they cancel out the hum that might exist around the pickup, aside from what the strings are doing. Mm -hmm. An output transformer work a, a push pull output transformer works the same way. It amplifies the signal, and by virtue of the two halves combining, and one half being flipped so that it's in phase with the other half, and combining in the primary of the output transformer, they cancel out power supply noise. They cancel out um, odd harmonics and noises and things like that. They eliminate some noises that are mm -hmm. common to single ended amplifiers. Okay, that's why matched power tubes are important because they have to, if they're matched, they more seamlessly buck hum and combine their power right. when they're matched. If they're not right. matched, one tube is always working a little harder. Mm -hmm. If the phase inverter is clipping non-symmetrically, it, in effect, it's doing the same thing. One tube is working harder. When one tube is working harder, the cancellation of problematic parts of the amplification process start to be exposed. Mm -hmm. And they have a very characteristic sort of a quality. In the case of either a positive clipping before the bottom or the bottom clipping for the top, in either case, the result is this kind of a pitched sound. Right. So when you hear a high watt and you crank it way up, you hear this wah. Uh -huh. When you crank up a Marshall and you lay into it, you hear oink. Yeah, it's the vowel sound. Yeah, the E as opposed yeah. to the ah. Ah, right, exactly. That E sound, that characteristic E sound of the Marshall is the phase inverter clipping non-symmetrically so that one power tube is operating more than the other power tube, which gives lie to the 
actually, you you would want a mismatched pair of power tubes to try to compensate for that oh, in funny. an ideal world. I'm actually kind of surprised that somebody didn't come up with, we have a pair of power tubes ideally m- tested for marshals where one of them is 20% hotter than the other one. So it'll make it sound more like an open awe sound when it's distorted. I'm surprised somebody hasn't marketed that. It's going to happen now because I gave the story away. But um, uh, you can really hear that. You can hear it in play. Mm -hmm. And we actually have an example of that. Uh, A few weeks ago, our buddy Michael Nielsen did a thing where he – he had a he bought an early seventies uh, JMP, a non master JMP, and he's uh, a big Friedman fan, and uh, Friedman is a, a big you know Marshall guy, and so Mike Nielsen's got a BBE, and he's got this JMP. This I think it was a seventy six JMP that he got mid seventies. So he took the JMP and plugged it into a power station and then took the BBE, the Friedman BBE, and uh, or was it a BE, uh, and set them basically the tone controls and everything all the same, but the, but the Friedman has a master volume. So he set it so it was at the same volume as the JMP through the power station attenuated. And you can hear the result right here. Okay, so what you heard there was the, the the Friedman amp, all the controls set the same, except it's got a master volume and the master volume's turned down. So that means the power amp isn't working hard enough to go non-symmetrical. So the power amp is still down, way down in volume. It's down in the power range where it can't clip asymmetrically. So it's symmetrical. And what did you hear between those two? The Marshall cranked to the point where it is going asymmetrical has this decided claw to the sound. And the Friedman goes walk, walk. So if he actually, what I wanted him to do, he didn't do is to turn the master volume all the way up and run it through the power station. You would probably hear them start to really converge. Should we listen to it again? Now that you described it. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, give it a shot. So uh, same cab, same mic, same levels, same everything. But the Friedman has got, and Michael said this, if Friedman's got a little bit deeper low end, it doesn't really. It's that the power amp has the headroom to produce the low end coming out of the preamp because it's not maxed out. And the amp that <laughs> slam. Those not. are the males. What? <laughs> Oh, Wayne's comment. Oh, that was courtesy of Ed. Oh, that's hilarious. A blizzard, of nails. blizzard of nails. I've never heard that. <laughs> that, that sounds like something Ed would say. Even, you know, even if it's even if it's a hey, Michael, even if it's modded, it doesn't matter. The point is that what's happening in the power stage is instructional in that that's why it's such a great video for us to talk about it perfectly illustrates what we've been saying about how important the behavior of the power amp is and that it is a result of design and engineering decisions 
made at the time of executing the amplifier that determine its personality. And the same goes for, and I, and I always got to go six times around the block to get to a point and I apologize, but, but that's just, that's showbiz folks. Um, that's illustrates the whole point about the power station being transparent. Why is it transparent when it's got six L sixes and why can't it just have EL 34s? Well, it really could have either one. And we have had people that are so insistent that I know, I know what you're saying, and I even agree with you, but just humor me, all right? Just humor me. Just, I don't care what the result is going to be. I know that I asked for it. I know that I'm going to avoid my warranty, and believe me, I've had three guys say this. I don't care if, it's, if I don't get a warranty afterwards. I love it. I've got two other power stations. I can afford to screw with it. I just want to hear it for myself. Yeah. Hey, you know, that's an offer I can't refuse. All right, fine. Actually, it'll be great because I'll be able to talk about it. <laughs> and we'll be able to talk about that person's experience. So uh, it's, in a way, it's like, okay, it's a win-win, fine. We uh, sent him a new unit right off the production line, the same model as the other version he had, and put EO34s in it and just changed the bias. And that's all we did. Mm -hmm. uh, we changed the screen resistors because the screen current draw is a little different and you want to do that. That's another thing that amps that when you switch the power tubes, uh, uh, 6L6s have a little bit different screen current draw than EL34. So you want to compensate for that. So we did that mm -hmm. and then sent it to him and he goes, yeah, pretty much everything you said was exactly what I experienced, but I'm glad you did it. And I do hear a little bit of mm, 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 because he's one of those guys, you know, mm -hmm. that 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 has really OCD, the hearing thing that you, where you hear, you hear the difference in battery brands. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, regardless of what, regardless of under what circumstances you say you can experience that. If, if that's how you feel about it, hey, more power to you, that's fine. I know from my experience, when I hear something unique, the next day I don't hear it because environment is everything. Context is everything. We had in production, we had a, uh, we had a bunch of amps. Tyler. <laughs> and there was one of them. I, uh, uh, You hear what you want to hear, and you like the things that you like for the wrong reasons. And we're going to keep hammering that as long as this show lasts. <laughs> Not only because it's fun, but because it's true. Anyway, I heard something in this amp that we were working on, and I went, that just sounds wrong. I don't know what it is, but it sounds wrong. And it's a problem for another day because we've got 50 to finish. We got all the other ones out. They all were fine. They all passed muster. There was no problem, blah, 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 blah. And then a week later, we do another run, and I pull that, and we do a bunch of them. After I'm all acclimated, I have my test rig all set up. I'm used to the way it sounds. I'm all zeroed in on it. We pull that one and plug it in, and lo and behold, it sounded exactly like all the rest of them. Nah. And we shipped it. You know. And what is that? Who knows? Maybe the you know maybe the the exact moment that we put that one on the bench and te and did the complete final QC on it, the air conditioner in the system in the in the industrial building down the street from us went on and our line voltage dropped five volts and that happens all the time, and I didn't think about it or we didn't think about it or maybe it was just you know. A bad taco the night before. It could be anything. Mood. Yeah. 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 A, a, a telephone conversation. A shipment didn't arrive on time. Or mm -hmm. something exciting happened five minutes before that that just sort of took my attention away. Who knows? But what seemed like, I'm going to have to go through this thing from stem to stern to figure out what the hell is going on. And then a week later, it's like, what the hell was I thinking? Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, right. uh, one thing that I have discovered, and you and you and I sat and experimented with this, mm -hmm. is that 
at different volumes you and even subtly different volumes you experience the same thing completely differently oh and this all goes yes. back to the whole attenuation thing that not only you know whether it's transparent or how you hear it at a different volume all those things are environmental so um it, it also goes be, back to spls are, are drugs XBL is a drug. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you just go through this thing over and over again and they reoccur and they reoccur. And what we find is after we we've hammered it and discussed it too long and agonized over it way too much, we come to the same conclusion, which is it's a variable. It's a daily variable. I and come to the conclusion that I need to practice. It, uh, oh, there's that. And it's a nice, it's a nice convenient variable because it, sort of distracts you from, I really need to get my technique together because I saw it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is from the person who doesn't practice nearly enough. And, and, and people go, oh man, you sound really good. Yeah. I had a good moment. I had a good five minutes when I played that riff and that's the video you saw the one before that I wouldn't show you because then you would really know. <laughs> and, and, uh, Let's be honest with ourselves here. <laughs> I'm building amplifiers. Isn't that a clue? <laughs> you know, there was a question up. Uh, I'm reminded. I've, I was it. Who asked the question? Um, it was about amplifier selection and what it was from Modern Vintage. Um, he was asking about what are some of the things that you guys notice or look for when trying out different non fryet amps, much like Luthier's examining fret work, neck joints, nut cuts, and that sort of thing. I mean, okay. I would be coming at it purely as just the bonehead guitar player, but you're coming at it from... Okay. Let me, let me, dis let me dispel, you. let me dispel one of those annoying little things that, that, people that sell stuff do to confound uh, us poor overburdened people that are trying to find our way through a sea of BS and have to contend with things like this. Do matched balance phase inverter tooth make a difference? A difference in what? Mm. Always ask yourself, if you want to save yourself a lot of agony, when people throw marketing things at you like that, the first response from you should be to question the premise. And once you question the premise, you give yourself the power to think it through and then realize what a bunch of horseshit. Well, you know, um, this is funny. This reminds me, one of my friends that I grew up with, he's a philosophy professor at uh, Boston University now. I hit him up a number of years ago. Um, I wanted to just dive deeper into my own layman philosophy studies. So I hit him up and, you know, hey, give me kind of an independent uh, curriculum. You know, so he sent me all the stuff that he sends to his students. And he told me that uh, when he was going for his d doctorate, I believe, at USC, that um, his advisor told him, that whenever he's reading anything that he should write, any question that comes up, because he said, anytime you're reading anything by anyone else, you're in a battle for your own thoughts. <laughs> I love that. I love that because it's the same thing. I mean, just apply it to being marketed to, like you're in a battle for your own thoughts. So you're, that's actually what you're talking about right here is before you just go, oh, that sounds like a good idea. like. What? Wait. Why? 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 Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's and there's a couple of related comments here that are that are that are pretty good. Uh and um let's see. First of all, Brendan, I love that. Is this a graph of my IQ over the years? <laughs> no, it's not your IQ going down. It's your brain being saturated by BS and you just have to spend a little more time cutting through the crap. So that you can, so that you can focus. You're, we're actually getting smarter, but we have more information to work with. You know, there's a great old Fripp quote 
where he's talking about music and the perception of music mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and creativity. And he said, the problem with new player, the newer crop of players out there is that they have access to history. Right, right. Meaning that you're you're so bombarded with what's out there mm-hmm. that you it it's it limits your bandwidth for create your in, individual creativity because you're so full of what's out there and you think you know I have to comply I have to conform uh, that's what everybody likes maybe I should be doing that and you sidestep your own individuality and creativity by doing that so yeah in a way that's true and and the way yeah. to, the way to kill yourself of that is is to be a contrary and punk ass I'm going to try it for myself kind of person like I am and that yeah that rubs people the wrong way people think I'm hardcore or a little intense to deal with and blah 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 and it's just me battling to maintain my space in order to keep fo- my focus and sometimes yeah sometimes it, it gets irritating because everybody wants to impose their reality on you and you have to you I mean you have to be polite you know you have to be understanding you have to try to listen and sometimes you just don't have the patience to do it because what you really want to be doing is this i want to be doing this and i want you to like just stop with all that and that's why i have to like go into my little hole and isolate myself so i can ah, just do this and get uh, all this stuff off of me <laughs> um and the one thing that's that's really distinctive about the videos you do is that, and you even flat out said this to me. I said, you know, this video would be really cool if you did something more. You know, we just can you just like do a little bit of a Eddie Van Halen kind of a riff, not exactly copy and Eddie Van Halen, but just something in that direction so sort of people get the point. And you just looked at me like, I just don't really do that. I don't know how. And I'm like. I caught myself. I went, I'm doing it to Joe, you know? Oh, that's interesting. And I don't remember having that. I, I'm imposing something on this guy that not only is irrelevant, uh, but you're being honest and straight up and saying, yeah, that ain't my, that ain't my, that ain't my gig, dude. You know, uh, uh, I have been that I, guy. I, I, I immediately appreciated that because I, that's the same response when I would be like on a project in a recording studio and the producer goes, give us a little blah, 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 you know? And no. I would just like, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I've done. Give us a little, uh, uh, um, <laughs> I remember the what's very it, first what, commercial the, session. The, the Cars producer, Tom, uh, what's his? The Cars producer. The Cars producer. Thomas, Tom, uh, oh, uh, yeah. I, I did the, I did this to a producer. Uh, uh, come on, what's, what's the, co- the Cars producer? Uh, I don't know. Three names ends with Thomas. No mm. producer, not the singer. Well, that's Rook of Kasich. Roy Thomas Baker. Thank you. Thank you. He produced the cars. Yeah. Um, well, he did a lot of amazing things. I found out later, but he, oh, he yeah. Did. Yeah. Anyway. So this producer goes, yeah, give me a little of some artists. And I said, Great. And I want you to put a little Roy Thomas Baker on it when I do. And he kind of looked at me like. <laughs> I remember those gigs. I didn't give a yeah, shit. Right. I, you know, I, I didn't I, give a shit if I got fired I, from. So I, I, I felt I was feeling my oats a little bit there. And Queen. Yeah. And um, I actually met him. He was a nut. He was a nutcase. Real sweetheart of a guy. Really unassuming. He was at a party and I just thought he looked really familiar. So uh, I went and I started talking to him and, and, uh, and I, I, and uh, I introduced myself. I said, I'm Steve Fry. Well, what do you do? And he says, he says, oh, well, I, I said, I make amps. And he says, uh, and I said, oh, I'm Roy and I make records. 
You know, it was kind of like that. And I went, yeah. oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> um, could you make an amp that, okay, sorry, I, I got way off track. You you had a point that you wanted to, like, tie a couple of things together. Uh, I do. I don't remember yeah. what I was saying. We were, sorry about that. Um, no, not a problem. Um, what was it? What were we talking about? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Bebo. <laughs> We're getting too philosoph- philosophical here. Oh, Kant. <laughs> I can't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. That's very nice. Nice touch, dude. Could That's you make great. an amp that could make various vowel sounds? Well, I imagine. Let's take a current try amp like the Deliverance and set it up so that it gets different vowel sounds. Uh, I could do it, but why should I do it when you could do it? What do you mean by that? What do we mean by that? Let's talk about that. <laughs> You're going to set that up, and I'm going to go fill up my water glass. What do you mean? I'm already set up. But okay. Well, no. What you're going to do? What you're going to do is you're going to go into stereo mode, where I would normally echo. Well, we'll see if I even actually get it to work. There we go. And then I gotta switch to stereo mode. So I'm going to do that. The, the StreamYard thing uh, has an echo con- cancellation. But when you put it in echo cancellation, it defeats the stereo audio. So I have to turn that off in order to get it to sound right. When I do that, Joe's microphone uh, will uh, echo. So he's gonna, I think he's going to mute himself. Uh, but, okay, Joe, uh, does that sound okay out there? Sounds good? Uh, I'm going to see how much I can turn my monitors up in here. I like your stereo. What? And, and echo. echo. Say that again. They're here in stereo out there. I have, I have to turn my mic off when I'm doing this. Uh, to uh, so that I don't feedback, so I can turn my monitor up. So what I'm going to do, I have a I have a D60 here. And I have it set up going through the power load IR. And the power load IR has an analog cab sim like it has always had. And now it has the IR in it. And they come out on separate outputs so that you can treat them separately in your DAW or in front of house or whatever. Which means that you can pan them right and left and you can have the best of both worlds. Um, so um, what I'm doing here is not really showing off the PLIR right at the moment. I'm going to show you what the deliverance will do at different power levels uh, by turning the master volume up and the gains down. So what I'm basically doing is I'm reducing the preamp and turning up the master volume to increase how much saturation happens in the power amp but it doesn't really change the volume too much for you guys because it's the, the actual signal that gets sent to the stream is about the same. So the result is you're gonna hear kind of what you heard on the, uh, the Mike Nielsen clip, which is what the amp sounds like with the clean power amp and more preamp distortion, and then what it sounds like with more power amp saturation and less preamp distortion. And, it's going to go, Stephen, to answer your question about setting it up for different values, vowel sounds. We're going to make the amp change its sort of vowel characteristic by pushing the power up harder and harder until it finally does start to go a little bit non-symmetrical. It won't do it as much as a Marshall, but it will do it uh, to a certain degree. And uh, can we make it variable? Yeah, we could probably make it variable. Do we want to? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, it, it's a thought. Yeah. Everything is worth considering once in a while. So I'm going to turn my vocal mic off and I'm just going to show you. So what you're hearing 
is the analog cap sim on the left, uh, an IR on the right, just a random, probably Celestian, it's a pretty generic Celestian, because it isn't gonna matter. The dynamics and the voicing of the analog cap sim are gonna fill out the weaknesses that you typically find in an IR. And uh, so it's not gonna matter a whole lot which speaker model we're using the IR, all right? And I'm gonna start off with, like I said, the power amp volume low, gain high, and then uh, power amp uh, gain, the preamp gain low, and power amp volume high. <coughs> Okay, did, did that come through pretty? Did Very hear, much. Did you hear the, the in the second example, the, uh, it got more of that claw? Were you able to tell? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Were you able to tell the, the difference in those two settings? I'm just okay. nodding because I'm echoey. All right, I just want to make sure. Uh, now I'm going to um, I'm going to really accentuate the claw by turning the treble and the presence up and readjusting the gain so that it's a lot more so that it emphasizes the claw. Nice job, Ilroy. Serious power section clippage. <laughs> Jeremy, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so what I did at the end is um, the the second to the last thing I played, I turned the the uh, gain way down on the preamp side and turned the master volume way up and the treble way up. And I turned the depth up a little bit too to get that real rumble on the bottom that would all kind of fall apart with the power amp push that hard. Mm -hmm. And so that gives you the, the extra emphasis on the top end, which is sort of the Angus thing. And that's why that comes through. And then I turned the gains way back up and the master volume back down again and back down the treble a little bit and played the same riff. And as you could hear, it just did, the riff didn't have that, vibe anymore it was like why would you even bother playing that riff because it isn't about the riff it's about the vibe and that whole claw anger pissed off angus bit you know disappears when the, when the the power amp isn't doing that angry sort of voicing thing so mm -hmm. in answer to your question steven yeah you can get the power amp to do it uh, it it's almost you're going to be attenuating the amp anyway to get it to the sound 
that to get to the sound that you want to get it at, at the volume you want to get it. So use that tool to learn how to sculpt the amp and use the power station. I'm using the, the power load, but it's the same load. Use it and the sculpting tools on it, and you can do that yourself. You don't need a special mod from us to do that. And 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 you, I mean, there it is. You heard it, right? Yeah. Steel. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, I mean, it's there. It's there. All you got to do is dig for it. It's in there. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a lot of the uh, a lot of the thing that. Uh, the misconception about can I can an amp do a certain thing and and should I mod it to do this or that? Well, what are you doing when you're modding an amp? You're either most of the time, especially martial mods. What are you doing? You're increasing the gain. How? Making a, increasing the bright gain, increasing the mid gain, increasing the full bandwidth gain. That's pretty much every mod is one is some variation of more gain and more treble, mm -hmm. or more gain and more mid. Or more mm -hmm. gain, more bass, and in this day and age, <laughs> how many new guys coming out of the woodwork can modify a Marshall and make it just distinctively different than the modding that's been going on the last, you know, fifty years? I did my first mar master volume mod in nineteen seventy two. Wow! I didn't even know what I was doing. Some guy was a um, some guy in my in my class at college. Uh, I told him I knew a little bit about amps, and you know, I was I was a drummer. But he says, "Oh, I have a uh, oh, you fix stuff." I said, "Yeah, I, I'm kind of learning how to fix amps and stuff." And he says, "Yeah, I, can you do? You know what a master volume is?" And I'm like, "Master volume? Well, I I know in essence what a master volume is." And he goes. Can you put one in my twin? And I said, yeah, why would you do that? He goes, well, because it makes it sound better. And then how does it make it sound better? I didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and while, you know, it's like, it's the thing. I just I read it, you know, somebody, <laughs> and, and I don't know, but somebody I don't, I don't know, but it must be good because some rock star did it. So can you do it? <laughs> it was on the gear page. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever passed, for the, whatever passed for the gear page in, in 1972 in Seattle, that was probably, there was a, there was an underground newspaper called uh, the Helix in Seattle. It was like Seattle's Rolling Stone at the time. So maybe he read it in the Helix, the counterculture newspaper that hippies sold on the street corners. It's whispered. Yeah. So I, I went to the, this music store that I frequented and, um, and bar they had a Fender schematic book, and I borrowed the book, and I looked at the schematic, and and I knew master volumes from PA systems because I worked the sound system in school, right, in the gym and in the in the auditorium, and so there were a bunch of mic inputs, and they, each mic had its own volume and tone controls, and then there was another volume that controlled all six or eight microphones simultaneously. And it was the master volume. So that was the concept. I got that. Can you figure out how to do a master volume in a, in a Fender Twin? Well, let's see, there's two channels in a Twin. So, and they each have their own volumes, but there's no master for both of them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sounds doable. I'll, I'll kind of slog my way through it and figure it out. And so I did. Did you drill a hole? Did I did not start? drill. I did not drill a hole. I put it right. in place of the the tremolo. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, do you use the tremolo? Ah, no, I never. I never no, no, no. Okay, can I use the tremolo position? Yeah. So I put it in the tremolo, and uh, and that was the last I heard of it. I didn't even know what I did or why I was doing it. And I, he said, "Do it," and I kind of logic it out and figured out that it's going to be X place in the schematic. And mm, that looks pretty good. You know, so <laughs> I did it. And, uh, um, and it was really funny is like later on when I started working at Valley Arts and I knew much more about it. Uh, and I had a twin in for repair and I was looking at the schematic and I looked at the schematic and went, 
holy crap, I really butchered that faster volume job I did for that kid in college. Oh. I did it totally wrong. <laughs> but oh, it didn't bother him. He thought it sounded fine. So what I actually did sort of th- threw the phase inverter completely lopsided. So maybe that's what he liked about it. Oh, that's interesting. Because uh, I remember we were talking about this recently. And, uh, you know, you were making the point to me that, you know, it's kind of another one of those funny things that you see repeated over and over again of, uh, well, well, this amp has a great master volume. Yeah, yeah. This I love this, Jeremy. Yeah. Jeremy, got, Jeremy got beat on by his wife for me. I know. I know. For I me love treading that. through his speakers. Oh, sorry about that, Jeremy, but hey, goes with the territory, you know. It's, it's wrong row. But so a master volume is a master from volume. Lizzie to WTF. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, that was the that was the nicest thing anybody said to me all day. Thank you very much. But a master volume is a master volume, right? Yeah, and um, there, you know, and, and so yeah, the good master volume as opposed yeah. to what? Well, it's funny. Um, I never hear anybody say this amp has a bad master volume. I just hear people talk about well, my amp has a great master volume. Yeah. What do they mean by that? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. You know what we should do is we should get a gra- we should try, try to find a little graphic of Soupy Sales holding his what do we mean by that sign so that cuz I'm going to be using that. I just love that phrase. <laughs> because what he's Soupy Sales is a comedian in the 50s and 60s, a kid and he had a kids show. And uh he was just a nutcase and uh he would have this segment in the show where he would just say some nonsense. And then he would say, what do we mean by that? Like, okay, now we're going to like take this apart or something. And he never really did. He would just like ramble and go off into some other alternate dimension. But I just. It's a comet coming by the planet. Yeah. We're actually going to talk about it. No, we're not. Yeah. But it was, it was like a loss leader and I, and, and it was like Lucy in the football. I always went for it. Oh, He's going to tell that us something. The explanation. Like, yeah. And then and then there would be some other cacophonous thing that would occur that completely distracted attention. And you never found out what they meant by that or what the hell they were even talking about because it was craziness anyway. But it was hysterical. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, what do we mean by that is, again, take any premise that somebody proposes to you and try to – Isolate yourself in the moment so that you're not influenced by the the presentation or the white patent leather loafers with the gold chains on the top or, you know. That might be next for me, actually. All, all of the usual distractions that take your mind off of the central focal point of what is being discussed so that – that's how you just sort of navigate the BS, right? And get to what, what am I being told? Am I being told uh, a bullet point intended to induce me to buy? Or am I being given a valuable piece of information that I can actually sort of plug into my my quiver, my, you know, and make use of it? So um, I always love these things that I read where people sort of parrot that same thing. Mine has a good master volume. Yeah, well, my amp has. I I don't need an attenuator because my amp has a particularly good master volume. Does your master volume in your amp allow you to turn the power amp stage of your amp up to what would normally be 110 decibels of output down to 70? Does it do that? If it doesn't, then... It's not that there's anything wrong with the master volume like we showed you in Michael's video. Of course not. It's that that Ron White, the comedian, he he did this thing on Florida, the hurricanes in Florida. Tater salad. Yeah, yeah, about the guy that was going to he was going to ride out the hurricane by strapping himself to a tree. 
And he says, it's not that the wind is blowing. It's what the wind is blowing. (laughs) And when you strap yourself to a tree on the coast in Florida during a hurricane and you get broadsided by a Volvo station wagon, it's all over. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you were thinking that sounded logical at the time. The reality is what you're after. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You caught the tater. Caught the tater. (laughs) <laughs> and and the point was focus uh, focus grasshopper there is information there available to you you just got to clear out the the, sh- the the bright shiny objects and you get to the point okay why are we why what do we mean by that we mean that the master volume let's look at a master volume let's look at two master volumes can we look at two at a time or we have to do one at a time? I think we have to do one at a time. All right. Well, let's do a standard master volume first. Here is a standard master volume. This is a JCM 800, as you can tell by the text. And there's conveniently circled in red. There's the master volume, which is position. It's a one meg pot across the treble control to ground, feeding the signal to the phase inverter. Which, if you hit that phase inverter hard enough, it will go non-symmetrical and cause the power tubes to max out at slightly different points in their amplification cycle. What makes that master volume better than another master volume in another amp that has basically the same tone control topology, the same value of master volume in that circuit, and about the same amount of gain to the left of it in the preamp stages? Answer, nothing. What makes a good master volume of all the, and this is the typical master volume circuit that you'll find in PVs, Marshalls, Hughes and Kettner, Bogner, blah, 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 Fryat, da, da, da. Um, So what makes one better than the other one? They're all, in essence, the same. The answer, it's not nothing. The, it's what happens before the master volume is what's different and what happens after the master volume is different. So when you say, mine's got a really good master volume, what you're really saying is, well, my amp really works well with the master volume that's in it because the preamp gain is sufficient for me to turn it down and sound good. Right. But that's too many words. So I'm just going to say, yeah, mine's got a good master volume. It's not the story and it's not correct. It's just a convenience in communication. Uh, All right. Now, why the one meg value? Because a tone stack is a series of three different filters stacked on top of each other. That's why it's called a stack. And it's they're a relatively high impedance sort of conglomeration of resistors and capacitors. So when you put a pot across the output of the treble control to ground, you're basically putting a resistor Mm. from the treble control to ground. And then the wiper just varies the point at which the signal is tapped off of the resistor to feed to the next stage. But the 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 fact of the resist the value of the resistance has an effect on the behavior of the total tone stack in that the more you load it down the more the frequency ranges that the tr- the controls operate at will shift up or down they will shift down if the pot value is the master volume pot value is lower and they will shift up. In other words, the treble control will sound treblier with a one meg pot and it'll sound more like a mid range control with a 250k pot. Just like why do you use a 250k pot in single coil pickups and a 500k pot in, in, in humbuckers? It's the same kind of deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- and that's kind of part of the problem with master volumes is you don't want them to, to low. When you modify an amplifier with a master volume, 
then you potentially change the behavior of the massive volume. Well, I want a massive volume that doesn't change the sound of the amp, just does massive volume. I want to change the whole t- sound and behavior of the amp without changing the sound and behavior of the amp. <laughs> Think, grasshopper. Think it through. Um, and by and by allowing you to turn the master volume down, you can turn the channel gains up higher, which makes the tubes, the preamp tubes generate more distortion because they're overloading each other, which changes the behavior of the amplifier. So it's almost like what happens on loading the, the tone control circuit is practically irrelevant because everything before it has been modified in how it's going to behave, which is desirable. So how can a massive volume be good and be undesirable at the same time? <laughs> it's all personal preference. That's, a, that's the answer. So uh, the other part of it is when it, and this, we've I learned this very early on, <laughs> is that how you hear a new amplifier that you've never heard before is how you hear it. Your introduction to that new amplifier that you've never heard before is your first impression. You've shaken hands with that animal, and now you're friends. But then when you put another part in it and modify it, then you've changed it. Mm -hmm. And then, well, I like the change, but I also don't like a little bit of what went along with that change. For every problem, there's a solution. For every solution, there's a compromise. Mm. And when you hear something a way, and then you change the, and then something changed in the product that you heard so that it sounds a different way, the next person that never heard it before is going to hear that, oh, that's great. I never heard something that sounded that great before. That's really great. And you go, I don't know. They sort of like got the mid ranges all messed up now. What did they? Why right. did they do that? And and and, and, right. and well, that's evolution, right? You know the great story about that. Not amps, but guitars is, uh, you know, Jimmy Page's number one Les Paul. Uh, you know, apparently he bought that from Joe Walsh, and the reason that Joe Walsh ditched it, he loved the guitar. But he had some repairmen. Um, he said, you know, I just want a little of the girth taken off the neck. Oh. He loved the guitar. A little so, of the wood off the neck. Yeah, so he gets the guitar back, and the neck is what the wood. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, <laughs> and Joe's going, I can't. Now I hate this guitar because I remember how it was, and now it sucks. So he, you know. Zeppelin comes through, Joe takes it to Jimmy Page, and Jimmy says, this is great, like this thin neck on an old Les Paul, like this is wonderful, this is what I was looking for, right? It's that same kind of thing that you were just citing. What's it kind of like? It when- Brandon, Brandon, is, are you drinking, dude? Because like you're like letting your freak flag hang out there a little bit. Well, hey, more power to you. You're welcome to the club. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Uh, the good master volume versus the bad master volume. There is no good master volume. There's no bad master volume. There's just differences of behavior. So let's – now, somebody might come along and go, hi, Michael, post-phase master volume, post-phase inverter, PPIVM. Joe, roll up the PPIVM. MV, PPIMV. Mm, let's get the letters right. I think I need uh, I've got sparkling water, which is fine, but that's not what I want. <laughs> okay. PPIMV, post phase inverter master volume. We talked about the phase inverter and we talked about the behavior of the phase inverter and how a lopsided phase inverter will affect the the vowel characteristic of the amplifier. Um, now, now we want to talk about where we're going to put a master volume in the circuit in order to enable more 
distortion or more complex overdrive. So what we're doing with the post phase inverter master volume is basically putting the master volume one stage farther to the right in the schematic than the traditional master volume. And in doing so, we're able to add another tube to the overdriven stew before the power tubes see it. Um, okay, now the problem is that the phase inverter has a positive swing and a negative swing, as you saw in the previous uh, diagrams showing the phase inverter um, swinging positive and negative and in some cases, either clipping symmetrically or asymmetrically on the top or asymmetrically on the bottom. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> the whiskey fairy has blessed me <laughs> yet again. And <clears throat> so... One of the things that we can do to increase the amount of distortion is to overdrive the phase inverter without still sending so much signal to the power tubes that they drive the speaker to full volume. The other nice thing about the post phase inverter master volume is that um, Once the phase inverter goes non-symmetrical, after you overload the phase inverter that's non-symmetrical enough, it will start to look symmetrical again because beyond a certain point, the phase inverter can't amplify non-symmetrically infinite for an infinite range. At mm. some point the clipping on the top and the clipping on the bottom becomes more or less symmetrical because you've maxed it out. You just can't send, it can't output any more signal than you put in. So it almost starts to write itself a little bit. It mashed. Everything's mashed in there and kind of yeah. getting, it's compressed, yeah. right? Yeah. And one of the key features of the PPI MV is that it imposes this sort of mashed, homogenous, <sighs> to the mm. sound, which great for bedroom volume. It has a distinctive sound of its own, which I don't like because it completely erases any possibility that there's gonna be any spank on the strings. I was just gonna say, to me, it's a congested sound. It's a congested sound. And I, that's um, the thing that I look for in an amplifier to not have at in, any cost. In 1980, uh, just not based on my reputation because I wasn't there long enough to have a reputation yet, but I was working at Valley Arts and uh, um, 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 uh, right on the tip of my tongue and I lose him. Uh, Journey guitarist, please help Neil, me. Neil, Neil Schoen. Neil Schoen, tech, brings in his high watt. He was using high watts at the time. So I figured we maybe we're gonna bond over high wise. Hell never yeah. Happened. Never happened. But they brought over a high watt. They heard that the guy at Valley Arts knows something about high watts. And so they brought this high watt and to have it checked out. And he said, it sounds a little congested. Hmm. And so that's thinking, not the hallmark of a high watt, my friend. Yeah, yeah. I'm going, high watt, congested. All right. What's <laughs> what's broke? So um, they bring it over and, uh, oh, yeah, it's been modded. Oh. So I look inside and it's got a master volume that's after the phase inverter. And because the phase inverter has a positive half and a negative half, each distinctly separate from the other that drives its own uh, appointed pair of power tubes, it has to be a dual ganged pot, one for the positive side and one for the negative side. Mm. All right, and so um, so I saw, oh, it's got a dual gang. Oh, it's got a master volume that's after the phase inverter. I get it. Yeah, those always sound a little squishy. And even at my experienced 
state in those days. I had experimented with high watts enough to to know that, yeah, that. Sorry, there's like I've seen on forums where that circuit and modifications of it were like invented eight years ago. And no, 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 no. They were around in the 70s, and late 70s. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and I looked at that and I, and I thought, well, it's kind of, I get it. It's overdriven and it sustains more and all that, but it sort of erased the high wattiness of the high watt. Yeah. But obviously he wants it in there and taking it out isn't going to solve the problem. So I thought, well, what can we do to get some of that detail and sparkle back. And so I did what you kind of do on a guitar pot when you turn it down. I put a bypass cap on each half. Oh, of it. Huh. So that as you turn it down and get it squishier and squishier, the top end will squish less than everything else. Yeah, so you're going to bleed out that top end. It will maintain some, some, some detail and clarity as you turn it down. Oh, yeah. And I thought, I wonder if that's going to work. And I turned it down. I went, that works way better than this dummy had any right to expect, you know, because again, I was really just winging it at the time. But mm -hmm. that was my concept was it should work like this. And mm -hmm. much to my surprise, it worked just like that. Gave it back to him. Oh, whatever you did, that's great. Yeah, we're going to bring you another one to do it. Mm -hmm. It didn't really amount to anything afterwards, but... Um, it gave me a really good sort of insight into that thing and why I didn't ever think that that was going to be the way to go. And, um, you know, I mean, with the power station, I, we hear comments uh, like, where have you been all my life? Where, where were you 40 years ago when I needed the power station? Well, it was in gestation stages. It was there, but it was in gestation stage. And uh, by that time, you know, Mesas were really coming hard on the scene and it just sort of deflected all the attention away from that because it was a little tiny package that did wah, you know, and had distortion and sustain and blah, blah, blah. And they basically just sort of obscured the whole conversation for the longest time. Yeah. yeah. And it didn't really come back into importance until, until vintage, you know, the, the vintage mentality and straight ahead non-master volume and all that stuff started to come back around. And in its inevitable cycle that it would, you know, and so, you know, those cycles, they come and go. And then it just like the, the, the fact that the power station came out when it did and hit the, the, the guitar playing public's consciousness, the way it did when it did was just, it's just serendipity, really just luck, just dumb luck. Um, but it, having said all that really the foundation of it is just the understanding of what behavior we want out of the power amp and what these other solutions sort of bring to the table and take off of the table at the same time and uh it's just a never ending cycle of balancing trend <laughs> against need and desirability and convenience and circumstance mm -hmm. and um when we all have to go hole up in our man caves and make life bearable for ourselves and, and, and have something to, to, to get together with our friends and, and commiserate about online or by the phone or whatever. It's like, it's like, it's like food for thought, food for conversation. And it's, a, a way to go, hey, you know what? I was able to rediscover all my amps that I've been laying around that I can't really do anything with. And I was just thinking I should just sort of, you know, thin the herd was a thing a year ago. I really thought, man, hey, I think it's time to thin the herd. You know, like, no, no, no. You like redefine the herd, man. <laughs> you, you, uh, you, uh, you, um, um, uh, you you evolve the herd. You 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 repurpose the herd. Yeah, I actually remember that was something that you kept telling me uh, repeatedly when we talked about you know kind of messaging uh, about the power station. And you know we actually haven't talked about it much, um, even though we are now. Just this idea of um, you loved seeing the power station as a almost a, like a reimagination device for amplifiers that um, 
Well, for everybody's amplifiers, stuff you've been using forever, stuff that's been sitting in the garage with its cover on forever. I mean, what's that that funky amp you have in the shop that we talked about maybe doing something? The Selmer. Like, yeah, the Selmer. What a freak of an amp. Ooh, that is a that freak is. of an amp. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I cannot ever sell gear. Man, I can. I need yeah. to sell. I actually do. Uh, so for me, and I realized in, I'm, I'm still kind of like connecting the dots way back in my career to currently and realizing that there is a continuous line in there. It's not a broken series of, it feels like a broken series of paths that off back on off back on but if i really think about it there's been a continuous thread all the way through this that goes way back to the first time i transitioned from a 50 watt high watt to a 100 watt high watt and just eviscerated myself in front of an audience without even knowing that i was going to be doing that and i did it to myself and i and that was probably the the point in my guitar playing life which was i was pretty green by then at that point but that was a defining thing in my whole career that that made me go there is a there's a perfect point in there and i'm not only am i going to find it but i'm going to find that i want to be able to control it and refine it because and, that 100 watt high watt was completely uncontrollable, I'm sure. That had to have been. That's not a bad thing. That's there's the right there's a time and a place for that. Well, so you, you were probably you, thinking, you do, yeah. I, I but it's still at the time there were time there was a time and a place where I could get away with it, and there was. That was 10% of the time, but there was a time where I went, yeah, I really shouldn't screw with this because, I mean, it's right, right, right. So, you know? so what did you do? Did you – wait, I think you told me this. Did you trade in your 50 watt for 100 watt and just I think you just set it up the same? Yeah. Show up and set it up the same and it'll just yeah. be a little louder and yeah. – And no. <laughs> no, little boy, No. <laughs> Bend over. We need to give you fifty more lashes. Yep. Thank you. Um, you yeah, thank you. Thank you. And another. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. It was, it was like when when I was in junior high school, we had this we had this uh, uh, the the metal shop teacher mm -hmm. Richard Imori, a Japanese American dude. He was an American. Uh, uh, he was in the Navy in World War Two. Buff. Little guy, my height, just svelte, really mm -hmm. intense. Mm -hmm. Right at front and center. I have to walk up to the front because I goofed up a little bit. Grab your ankles. You need like the bench brush, not on the butt, but on the calf just below your butt. Really? Yeah, he knew where it really hurt. He knew how to really deliver the, the burn. Once and, upon a time uh, in America, huh? Yeah, and uh, and yeah. So the way to make sure that you got two more of those was to, you know, for you were supposed to grab your ankles, get the whack, and then stand up and go sit down. Mm -hmm. And me and one other guy were always the guys that stayed bent over, holding the ankles. Are you done yet? Oh, uh, guaranteed that you'd get another one. You know, and. Yeah. But you had to do it, right? Because you just had to do it. You weren't going to like just take it and and slot back your seat, man. You had to have you had to save face a little bit. So yeah, you're just like, oh, 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 you're done, and like that. Just, you knew you could see in his face. It's like, Argh. you just got him. That was the way you got him. Um, and th there is a time and a place. <laughs> I mean, you you've been there with this with the Sound City 100. We take people in the in the in the in the sound booth at Nam, and and turn the thing up, 
to the right volume without the attenuator on it with a strat because it sounds so great with a strat. You know, people are like, oh, it's going to be like a plexi with a treble with a strat straight in. It's going to be murder. No, and you go, and you go no. wang, and they go, that sounds amazing, and it doesn't hurt. But it's loud. I mean, I'll never play that loud, but holy shit, that's amazing. And um, so there is a time and place for that. And then when you put the attenuator on it and you, and you scale it back a little bit, it's it's like, well, you know, that's more manageable and great, you know, but you leave them when they leave with the impression that that thing with the Strat wide open like that was the voice of God. And that's what you want them to walk away with, you know, and it's, and it's intense, but it's also empowering musically to know that you have that at your fingertips when you need it. Yeah. And um, so when it, when it comes around to, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've all had the nun stories. Uh, when, when, it, when it comes right down to it, um, is an attenuator a compromise or is it a tool? And is it a tool? Are you using it efficaciously or are you just being lazy and just slobbering all over the sound of your amp by overdoing it? Oh, now, yeah. What were, you, what were you telling me about the Sound City 120? So... Naturally, I'm, I'm a member of the, the Sound City Owners Group, which is a Facebook page of, populated by a bunch of um, ne'er-do-well social past like myself that like the big, loud underdog amps that they are. Yeah. And, and um, you know, trying to sort of manage... Uh, having them using them, you know, with the pride of, you know, being the black sheep and all I'd love all that. I just love the whole vibe of that. And there's a whole group of diehard sound city, even the models that people in the eighties, seventies and eighties used to refer us to as the sound shitties. Yeah. The later models of sound city, not with these guys, man. No, that's the real one. That's the real sound. That's the, that's the sound. That if you're a real man, that's the amp that you, you know, and I, and I relate to that because you know, it's like, your city amp and you'll that, like that, it. That, that, that I'm going to give no quarter vibe. I just love that, you know? So yeah, it's, it's fun to see that, you know, and there's a guy in there that there, there, there was a guy that, that posted that, okay, which mod should I do to my sound city? 120, a sound city, 120. Now the LB, 120 is like a um, an post David Reeves, another engineer guy, sort of had his hands in it, and that was the era that started the Sound City over engineering themselves to death. Features that that 120 uh, watts though, man. Six six L sixes. Six L sixes. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, a useless master volume. And okay, I just violated that whole what does that mean by useless, useless master volume. There's no real gain before the master volume. So there's really no point in having the master volume. You're just turning the other volumes down. And in a way, the new sound cities are very similar. The master volume isn't really for distortion. The master volume is a volume to control two other volumes, just like a traditional PA. And I've seen a friend of mine has an early, early David Reeves amplifier model that I think was actually intended to be a public address sound system, two channels and a master volume. It was a very clean amp. It was proposed as a guitar amp, but really it was just a, a PA amp in guitar amp clothing. Um, anyway, long story short, um, the <laughs> there was a great sound city flyer ad that they uh their their uh their brochure the sound city brochure from like the early 70s was the new series of sound city amps they had gone out the sound city engineering staff had gotten together with major bands from around the world got together with their road managers and guitar techs yeah, right. to engineer the perfect amplifier for, for guitar players. What bullshit. And I read that and went, road managers and guitar techs? 
We talk to the road managers and the guitar techs. Now, no disrespect to road managers and guitar techs. They have their jobs. But but inspirational tone to write music and to ignite audiences is not your forte. Your job is to make sure that the shit works, that the strings are in tune, that the band is there on time for sound check and makes it to the next city on time and that everybody has got their passports and blah. And why the hell are you asking these guys, what would be the ideal amp and what's their answer going to be? We want an amp that's going to be in Antwerp on time that never breaks (laughs) <laughs> that net is not too loud, not too bright, not too dark, not too bassy, uh, and that the cabinets um, have wheels, and they got to be big wheels because we got to roll them across these stages with all these cables. And these are the guys that they're saying that they talk to. And why are they talking to the guitar techs and the road managers? Why? Why indeed? Why? Because the guitar, the the real guitar players are at the right house on sunset throwing televisions out the windows off the balcony. <laughs> care less about talking to a bunch of geeks, engineering geeks from England about or Michigan or wherever the hell they were, you know, and I just I just imagined this whole scenario and I read that and I went, "Oh my god, these guys are going to go out of business in a year." And of course they did. <laughs> but but um just just the whole wrongness of designed by committee and the wrong people you know trying to do the wrong thing and now this is going to go way way back i'm going to tie this all back to the guy that asked about paying speakers because hmm. the, the speakers are great quality and the company can actually produce them and they're really adamant about doing high quality but boy when it comes to trying to get the concept across to them that I'm asking you to do a thing a specific way for a specific reason because this is what I think is going to work for real guitar players that have real ears and real fingers and real instruments and really know how to use this stuff. And have them go, well, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. We'll we'll take it up with the gun, blah, 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 and get back to you. I'm like, no, you're not listening. But... um. Back to the back to the forum, back, back to the uh, the Sound City Owners Group Facebook page. I got a 120. Should I take four of the six power tubes out, or should I put a master volume in it, or maybe one of those PPI VMs? Uh, what do you guys suggest? And everyone's like, "Well, never under any circumstances put an attenuator on an amp like that." And I'm like, looking and going, "Why?" Every other solution for that amp is going to be a, an abysmal failure. And yeah, it's going to change the whole soup. It's going to either be useless or it's going to change the soup to the point where it isn't even really that amp. And remember, you know how popular the, the orange tiny terror was. Mm -hmm. PPI MV. It's Mm. got a PPI MV in it. Mm. And Why? Because it's a simple, simple, simple little amp. It's got a, a fair amount, not too much, not too little, but a fair amount of gain up front and two EL84 tubes that can't put out much torque or much volume. So they're going to give you some distortion. Mm-hmm. And in an environment like that, it's like the perfect solution because it'll sound really raging at bedroom volume. And the EL84s have that little sizzle. So that'll add that to the stew and that'll work. So that was kind of like a confluence of three different things that sort of really all work together. Mm-hmm. That would not work in another schism. Just like when Fender came out with the Rivera series amps, the Super Champ was the reigning champ of all of the models of that series that nobody bitched about. It's just like, we just can't get enough of these because it just had the right combination of elements. And I even said to Paul, I said, gee, why don't you make a bigger amp that sounds like that? And he just kind of went, <laughs> this is like, I just showed him how green I was. And he just like went, yeah, you really don't. You really don't get it yet, do you? And he didn't say that. He was very gracious, but he did snicker. And from the snicker, I went, what does he mean by that? And, you know. Uh, 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 it was a coded message. It was a coded message. Mm-hmm. So um, so I posted on the, on the, on the Sound City page, um, 
no, there is a place for the master volume here. And why you would use the master volume is because you want the output transformer to be part of the stew. And you want to use the power tubes being run at a maximum value so that they start to suck power out of the power supply. Because below that threshold, they don't, the power supply has got a lot of reserve energy in there that doesn't get used. And that makes it sound sort of sterile. So the whole point is you need to get it up to the point where the tubes are sucking current out of the power supply so that the power stage will start to breathe and, and push the output transformer hard enough, hard enough, not too hard, hard Mm -hmm. enough to where it starts to saturate. And when an output transformer saturates, the, the iron, the steel in the transformer is able to build a magnetic field to a certain level, and then it can't convert input power to output power past that level. So it actually causes magnetic compression. The output transformer actually has a characteristic kind of compression that it adds to the stew, and you need to push it hard enough to get it to do that. And... Uh, just coincidentally, Sound City original Sound City 120 output transformer. Wow. But you didn't see that coming, did you? The core is the iron. Um, it's a partridge. It's a partridge. Wow. Um, this is the this black part here is this is the core. This is the iron core. This is what develops the magnetic field. Now, this output transformer is physically about the same size as a Marshall 100 watt and a high watt 100 watt output transformer. So what does that say about the 120 with six EL34s in it? What it's saying is that those six EL34s can only do so much before this guy maxes out in terms of how much power from the input side will get to the output side. So, in other words, it doesn't really have as much iron as an amplifier that proposes to put out 20% more power than your average 100-watt active god. So, that means that's going to saturate faster because you're trying to jam more power through it. So, it's the ideal circumstance for using an attenuator because... It it's already on the verge of oversaturating a little bit. And so right. an attenuator, even a small amount, 3 dB, 6 dB, will cause output transformer saturation to set in and power supply sag to set in. So it's actually the perfect solution for that because when we talk about attenuation, and if you listen to all the shows that we've done so far and we're talking about this stuff. When do we ever say, oh, now you can dime everything? We never (laughs) say that because that isn't really what it's about to me, to us, to really most of the guitar playing public out there. What I mean, it can be done, of course. Sure. But it's more about nuance. It's it's about control and nuance. And as I did illustrated before with the D60 playing with where preamp distortion converges with power amp distortion, it's a matter of where do you get that balance right where you want it and right. having a tool that allows you to do that as opposed to getting it or not getting it or having it done wrong. Mm-hmm. Having infinite control, the voicing switches, the depth and presence controls, all those things that give you that ability to just really zero in on what you're hearing and here and having it come out there. That's what it's really all about, and so it's never been about uh, it, it's never been about just crushing the crap out of your end because I don't really even think it sounds that good that way. And any plexi I've ever heard with a full right hand sweep, it doesn't sound that good either. It just gets mid range and squashy, and everything start it starts getting flatulent and brittle, and that's not fun. It's fun for a minute. It's fun because you can say you did it, and and the feedback and and uh, you know the neighbors are banging on the floor below you and and all that and the excitement that it generates is is cool but as as a musical tool uh as a flavor that you have control over when you're making your musical stew no it's it's just it's the equivalent of 
of boiling the water and getting uh, putting a little salt and a little olive oil in the water and then boiling your pasta and getting it just to that point and then pouring a whole bottle of ketchup in it. Yeah, that'll do it. That's all it needed. Just a whole bottle of ketchup. Uh, why would you do that? Um, so uh, so my, I'm, I hold my ground on, sound, on the Sound City Forum. If you really want to know what I think about, well, what do you think about this? And, and one of the guys that responds, are, are you the Steve Fryette of Fryette Amplification? And well, hey, just, you know, just go search. I, I, I just posted my comment and I bailed out of there. And I said, watch the show tonight. I'm going to talk about this. Joe and I are going to go through this step by step by step. So you're going to see what this is really all about. And, and, and I bailed, so I didn't stay in the conversation. Um, but that's the deal. The deal is, is the attenuation isn't about damaging the amp. And we talk about this with customers all the time. I sent an email to output the transformer company a and they said uh i said can i use an attenuator with you guys's output transformer and oh god no don't ever do that blah 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 it'll avoid our 10-year warranty and you don't want to do that no 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 uh dear <laughs> output transformer manufacturer is it okay if I, when I put your upgrade output transformer in my amplifier, is it okay if I crank my amp up to a, a louder volume, you know, for the big gigs and stuff? Is it going to hold up okay? Oh, yeah. Our output transformers are very high quality and we have a 10 year warranty and they're very reliable and very you're, robust. Yeah, very robust and go for it. You're totally, we got your back. <laughs> Dear output transformer manufacturer, what is the difference between turning my amp up at a respectable volume to where the output is really starting to work into a speaker cab and doing the same thing into a reactive load? Transform manufacturer. Hmm. They're functionally the same load for the amp, so it should probably be fine either way. Dear output transformer manufacturer, Back to my first question. Can I use an attenuator with a reactive load in my amplifier? Did we answer your question? I hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs> the, the whole thing is this, this, why do we have the impression that using an attenuator is going to Destroy your amp, damage your amp, blow your output transformer, your precious vintage output transformer. Um, let's talk about that. How are we doing for time? Are we like we we way out in the weeds? We're uh, we're we're coming up on three hours. <laughs> let's just let's just nip this one in the bud then. When you guitar player pull out your precious JMP 1972. And the last time you played it, you heard this little <laughs> sound coming out of it during the gig. And you would thought, Oh, what's that? And then it stopped doing it. And then it did it again. <laughs> and then uh, you took a break and you checked everything and it all seemed okay. And then you went and played another set and, and then the DC fuse blows. Oh, blue fuse. Yeah, the fuse went bad. I need to put in a new fuse. Not something's going on. The fuse is an indicator. It's not a part, a component. It's an indicator of something. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, to a lot of people, a fuse is a part. Oh, a part blue. I'll replace that part. It's a consumer replaceable part. Why is it a consumer replaceable part? Think about it. Um, it's a consumer re replaceable part because once you solve the problem that's causing the indicator to indicate something, it will stop indicating. So you, the owner of that amp, play your last gig 
COVID comes, the world turns upside down. <laughs> uh, you don't look at your amp for a year and then uh, uh -huh. you don't do anything with it. And then you get a power station and you plug your Marshall into it and you f do a full right hand sweep and the fuse blows again. Oh yeah. I remember it did that before. It's doing it again. Ah. Um, well, let, let me, maybe I got to see what's, what's up with that. Maybe I'll call somebody or something, but let me just dig through my, my toolbox and, Oh, I got a two amp fuse. Well, I'll just try that where the one amp fuse was. You put the two amp fuse on the amp, you crank it back up full right hand sweep, you're blasting away and now you smell smoke. And then you send a tech support email to fry it. I blew the output transformer in my precious JCM. It always happens with these attenuators, and you said your attenuator was safe, and it did it to mine. What's the deal? You guys are responsible for the repair of my amp. You, the guy who did not check the tubes, did not maintain your amp, put double the size of the fuse in there, ignored the warning signs that something was going on, and yet when you put a power attenuator on it, did the worst thing possible by completely diming everything and thinking that that was a tone. It's okay. You ought to be able to do that. But it's going to be contingent on the quality of the part that was originally made and not even necessarily the age. People want to attribute that to age. Here is a perfectly working 1972 Sound City 120 amp output transformer that probably got a l overloaded multiple times in its, in its lifetime, and it's perfectly fine. And by the way, if anybody needs a SC120 output transformer, I've got one for a reasonable price so feel free to hit us up um oh well, you're operating the amp in uh under extreme duress yeah that's what you're doing and it's okay if the parts will handle it but are, you, but you're, 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 that's a gamble with any sort of mechanical yeah. or or uh well even biological systems you know when you operate them at their peak capacity I mean, you are you're rolling the dice on on things breaking down. I mean, that's just the nature of things. So it's not when the you drive when right? you drive 150 miles on an arterial street mm -hmm. where there's like where there's like eight school zones between your starting point and your dentist's destination, you're assuming some risk. Yeah. If right. I go out here and, and if I step outside here and I start sprinting, you know, the odds of me pulling a muscle are a lot higher than if I'm just walking. Hmm. It's, you know, well, I'm, you, I'm should walking. you should be I'm able to sprint. You should be able to sprint. Yeah, sure, sure. And but you, you do the stretches and you like, you know, you drink water and you don't try to sprint when it's 100. That would, be the, that would be the biological version of upkeep of an yeah. amplifier, right? <laughs> So well, we always, we've always said, but, but see, here's what feeds into the narrative that attenuators are dangerous. The same narrative that um, the, the same, the, the, the same narrative that drives the discussion we had before about what the manufacturer says about the design of their amplifier vis-a-vis EL34 versus 6L6s, they're interchangeable, and da 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 da. Um, probably a known fact, but maybe not known recently because a lot of people don't remember 30, 40, 50 years ago. But when Korg or, or Music Corp, or I forget who the name of the distributor was, was bringing Marshall amplifiers into the U.S. for sale, the U.S. distributor of Marshall. They buy Marshall amplifiers from Marshall, ship them into New York, and then just sell them at a markup out to the U.S. dealers. That's how distribution works. Uh a manufacturing company makes the amps the way they think they should be made. A distribution company as just like in a record company, they add a level of oversight on the product that they think is going to support the marketing and the, their sales position, their marketing objectives and blah, 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 blah. How mm -hmm. it's going to be presented. Do we want the artist to walk around uh, the, 
you know, on stage naked. No, we need to have some clothes on them or otherwise we're going to get some angry customers. We have to do all this stuff in the same way the distributor is going, yeah, we're having a little difficulty with the EO 34s. They're, uh, they're failing too frequently. Mm-hmm. And Marshall's going, well, they seem to be okay here. It must be something in the stew over there. And if the manufacturer is not, if the distributor is not that cooperative they're, or they're not accepting of that, then they're going to intervene a little bit. And so what do they do? Hey, you know, we got an engineer here in our repair staff that says that we could put 6550s in the amp and we could just change the bias a little bit and we'll have a more robust tube that's less likely to failure. How about that? And the guys at Marshall going, well, hey, you know, it's your product. You can just modify it however you want. Just don't put, just don't represent us in a bad light. And if it helps you, well, you know, maybe it helps you. It's kind of instructive that Marshall never did that in Europe. The only 6550 JMPs that ever made it into the public were in, you know, North America. Mm. Um, Why? Because there was a distributor in the United States that was an electronics parts supplier, probably supplied a lot of parts to Korg. And they went, you know... Uh, well, yeah, what's your price on 6550s? We've been buying a lot of EL34s. From them. We've been having sort of bad results with them. And our engineer says that we could probably get away with putting in 6550 in the product. And so give us a price on those. And and, the, and they're talking to a salesperson. The salesperson says, oh, well, they're like $2 more than EL34. Great. Send us 500 of them, 2,000, whatever it is. And they put them in the amp and they do the little bias tweak and they send them out. And what does the end user see? They see... Um, a little tag from the distributor that says, due to the difficulties we've been having with warranty concerns about EL34, is your new Marshall amp is shipped with 6550s. Did you ever see a label like that on any Marshall? Of course not. They're not going to like taint the waters by telling the consumers what's really going on. What are they going to say? The new model. It's brighter. It's more brittle. It doesn't distort the same way. It's got a whole different characteristic. It's the new, it's not the same as the old thing. It's the new thing. It's the new. In order to get you off of the, hey, it doesn't sound like the old one. It's the new model. What do you expect? It's the new model. It's cleaner. And right at a time. More articulate. Power PA systems were still in the process of development. So a little louder and cleaner was considered a good thing. And that became that became a, the I like that model. When a guitar player says, "Yeah, I prefer that model," they're not saying, "Oh, yeah, I like the one where they compromise on the bias circuit and put the tubes with the wrong impedance in it just to get over having to spend so much money doing warranty repairs." Yeah, that's the model I like. That's not what you say. I like that clearer top end, that punchier, throatier mid. You, because you don't know the backstory. <laughs> they don't want you to know the backstory. They want you to go, it's the new thing from the king of overdrive, the king of amplification. Mm-hmm. And they, they underpinned that marketing with a bumper sticker. I might have something around here that still has that bumper sticker on it, but the bumper sticker said, Marshall is pretty loud. That was the thing. <laughs> That's funny. But a KT88 or a 6550 has the same impedance characteristic as a 6L6. So the guys that say, I don't like 6L6s and Marshalls and poo-pooed when Marshall switched to 6L6s in the 90s because of Tiananmen Square and and the the demise of um, the Czech EL, the temporary demise of the Czech EL thirty fours and the availability of E thirty four, they switched to six L sixes to deal with that. And what did guitar players go? Oh no, I don't like that compromise. That was a shitty compromise, man. Those are, they don't sound good to that app because they didn't market it correctly. They didn't say, hey, we're coming up with this new thing that's going to be like the 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 genesis of the Fender sound and the British sound together in one app. And it's going. They didn't present it that way. They presented it as. It's the new 6L6 version. Well, I don't like the 6L6 version. Hey, well, but you bought into the 6550 version. Why did you buy into that and not the 6L6 version? Well, <laughs> but that was the that was 
that model is that that sounds like that model. That's that model. It sounds good that way. That's that model. But this is this model. It doesn't sound like that. <laughs> you get, trying to get in. This is what I love to do. I love to get in a guitar player's heads and see how they think. How I think about how I think. And I want to get into other people's heads. Like I said, people that we work with, artists that we work with. I want to get inside their heads the same way I get inside my own head, the same way I get inside your head. And and look for cause and effect there because that informs what what your predisposition is of things, you know, in the past, and how you're going to be predisposed to accept something going forward, how it's going to be presented, how it's going to be pitched, and that isn't as much a sales job, although it is marketing and sales, but it's more about how is the engineering decision that we're making on a specific model, doing it a specific way, going to be uh, received or interpreted by the average playing public, and what are going to be the pitfalls of that? And I'll give you a perfect example. When the Ultra Lead first came out, sold Zip. Really? KT88s and a, in a head? Yes, that's an, isn't that a knock it? I think they had 6550s when we first started making it. And it was kind of like, well, isn't that, that's the tube they use in, 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 in SVTs. That's a bass amp tube. Why are you putting a bass amp tube in a guitar amp? Well, because I think it sounds good. And I think there are practical reasons for using it. Mm -hmm. The 2150 stereo power amp was our most powerful, our most popular power amp at the time. It's a logical transition. Hey, if the power amp is really popular, let's put that power amp with a preamp. No brainer. Mm -hmm. no, no, it was a brainer. <laughs> <laughs> so we sell one ultra lead to 10 CLXs. In walks Paige Hamilton. Um, yeah, I, I really like the power amp. I just bought from you guys. It's amazing. What else you got? Well, we have this new model we're experimenting with. Uh, it's called the Ultra Lead. And, uh, oh, let me check that out. Ooh, that is it. That's the sound I hear in my head. Blah, blah, blah. He takes the Ultra Lead out on tour. And overnight, we went from 10 CLX to Ultra Lead to 10 Ultra Lead to a CLX. Wow. It's just all presentation, artist, association, and things like that. Um, oh. And... Uh, How you present it is is so important because um, if it seems like it doesn't make sense to somebody, then they're going to be predisposed to go, I don't know, that just kind of sounds like against the grain, you know, against the canon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really, you're doing something, you're not supposed to be doing that, are you? Well, wait a minute. We're, we're a manufacturer, we're we think about these things and we see potential here. Uh, it may not be what everybody is thinking about at the moment, but it's kind of how we see it. Mm -hmm. And, but it takes somebody who buys in to, to show out in the wild, the application of it, the practical application of this thing. And then it's all of a sudden, Oh, 6550s, KT88s are the new things in guitar amps. Check out this band. And automatically people start going, well, it's because they're big, powerful tubes and the big, powerful amp. And, and Paige would go, Paige Hamilton would go out on tour. Hamilton would go out on tour. They'd go to Europe and they would come back and like, you need to replace all the tubes. Why? Well, because we just got out on the road. We just got out of, off a tour and we did like 26 days. And, and you know, we hammered those tubes no, you didn't hammer the tubes. Oh, no, we hammered the tubes. We, mm -hmm. we had a jack, man. We were like cranking. Blah, 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 blah. Like, show me the settings. Bring, in your, bring the amps over. Well, you know, of course, we'll do the maintenance. We'll do whatever you need. Absolutely, yeah. whatever you need. Bring right. them on over. We're happy to take care of them. Do brush them all up. Do whatever maintenance. If they need tubes, great. But don't tell me that you're... you're pummeling the tubes. 
and because I went to your show, I could talk to you on stage while you were playing. Hmm. Your master, the global master volume and ultra leads at 12 o'clock. So, and you're running at half power. Don't tell me you're power pommeling. Well, you know, and we did all these dates. They're used to this thing of part of the reason that helmets came to us is because everything that they owned was breaking all the time. Mm. Breaking all the time. That was the first thing that Paige said to me was like, I just can't fucking deal with it. I go on stage. I set everything up. I meticulously get my rig together and blah, blah, blah. I go out on stage and all hell breaks loose and shit breaks and stops working. The sound quits and fuses are blowing. And I just fucking had it. And I'm going to do my best to make sure that you don't experience that any longer. And he took the stuff out. He goes, it's the first time I went out on tour where stuff didn't break. But he already had that ingrained in his head that well, they're out there hammering their gear. And obviously, they need to bring it into the pit mm -hmm. after 10 laps, after 20, 30, 40 laps, and do a pit stop. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. And they did, that's, that's just the way they characterize it. We need to get all the tubes replaced. And so they bring him in, and the tubes are practically like they're new off the shelf, which is what I expected. Under the circumstances, the way they're using them, they're just not running them very hard. But they're just, they had this dynamic range. They had this responsiveness. And their, pers their perspective on it was that they're pounding the shit out of it. So finally, I went to one of their shows, and the, 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 their, their guitar tech had took the backs off the amps. So the tubes that they didn't really have to replace would be really easily accessible if they did have to replace them. Yeah. yeah. And so he was telling me, oh, yeah, man, these guys are really like kicking the ass on those tubes tonight. And so I went up to the back of the amp and I did a – who was the, the Watergate guy, the, the, the guy that held his hand over the, the candle? I don't remember. Uh, Somebody will help us out with this in a minute. I went and reached in and I put my hands right on the top of the four KT88s, two KT88s per hand while they were playing like one right in the middle of one of their heaviest parts of their set. And I just went mm. and I'm looking at them. I'm looking at the manager and I'm, and he's looking at me like, and, and they, I, I held them there for the whole tune, the whole song. Uh -huh. And, uh, and he says, what the hell are you doing? I said, I'm trying to bring a malcontent. You're not hurting the power tubes. That's all. I'm trying to save you guys some aggravation. You don't need to be bringing your amps all the time and trying to spend money on tubes. The reason I'm, I'm not being lazy, it's not that I don't want to change them. You don't need to. I don't need to put them in. I don't need to charge you for them. You don't need to spend money for us to do this stuff. I don't want to spend the money. I want to help you support your band. I want you to go out and play and not think about the gear. But I also don't want you to tell me that I have to do something that I, you don't need me to do. Mm -hmm. Just strike that off your list. You're done with that. And it, it, it took a while for them to finally go. So now the last time that I've, the last time that, that, um, I had the same experience with Motley Crue, same thing. We kept recycling the tubes. Whenever they I I learned something from that. I don't tell them that anymore. I just keep STP, Motley Crue, same thing. When they bring their they go out and they do a tour and they bring their gear in and they want it all retubed and stuff for the next leg of the tour. I take all the tubes out that they had in it and I put them in a box. And I take the tubes out of that box from the previous tour and put them back in and check the buys, make sure they're all good and give them back to them. And I don't charge them for any of that. I don't have to charge them for tubes. I don't have to charge them for labor because it doesn't take very long. It's a, it's a, it's a service that we do for the artists to make sure that they're just comfortable with their gear and they don't have to think about anything. Now, okay, so STP goes out and they've got three classic power amps. So there's eight EL34s per power amp. And they go out and one of the three classic power amps that did get refreshed a new set of power tubes because it had been years, uh, put a new set in, G. Gordon Liddy. Thank you, Tyler. Um, G. Gordon Liddy, he, put, he held his hand over a burning candle to show what a, what a tough guy he was in the yeah. next administration. Um, uh, so one tube 
one EL34 of a new set of eight that I put in one of the amps failed. And, and, uh, so the guitar tech brings it in. Yeah, maybe we should replace them all. We, but we just replaced eight of them. Yeah, but one of them failed. And I said, that's a good thing. He says, what do you mean? I said, out of those eight, one failed. So your odds of even one of those failing has been so low over the years as to be almost not, not recordable. Mm -hmm. So if I replace all eight of them now, your odds of one going bad out of the next eight may be a little higher than the last time. However, if I leave those all in and just replace the bad one, the, the odds against that one bad one failing again or any of the other ones that made it through the tour that didn't fail have gone up 800%. <laughs> I just kind of try to apply math to it, and they and they do exactly what you did. They just go, "Okay, you got me, you got me," and and it's all about managing a relationship and trying to have a fun and trying to get them to relax about their gear because they are, and you know, we're all about our gear. I spent two weeks like going through. I'm kind of not. <laughs> you don't have to. You got it all. It's all taken care of for you. That's what our job is. <laughs> to, so that you don't have to think about it or worry about it. We work out all those little sort of psychological, you know, uh, bed bugs that should, they should not be haunting people out there that are trying to perform and play and be creative. They shouldn't be haunted by that stuff. Right, right, right. So right. Let, uh, let us, let us do that for you. You go out, you go out and I dare you to set fire to one of your amps. I dare you. I want you to do that. Mm -hmm. I want to know, but nobody does it. Yeah. yeah. Every once in a while. Uh, I think helmet came back after one tour that, uh, um, and ultimately it was on top of two cabinets toppled off the back of the cabinet and landed on the ground behind it. They still played the whole set with the amp. They just left it. They didn't want to touch it because it was still working. So they left it upside yeah. down on the back of the stage back there. It was still connected. It was still working. They were like, it's still working. No mess with a good thing. Well, you know, and they brought it back and the back of the panel was dented in a little bit. And, and, um, but they were like, God, it was it's just like it, it just kept working and we just kept thinking it's still working. We're in the in the heat of the moment. The mosh pit is going crazy, man. It's just like the the momentum is there. We don't want to break the moment and we didn't have to. And it, the, to me, that was like the most there couldn't have been a better, you know, compliment. Because all of our guys, all of our people here care about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it means a lot to us when somebody says that this gear saved our tour. You know, it yeah, saved yeah. Our it made us better players. It made it took the onus of thinking about shit that might happen off of our head and give us the bandwidth to do the thing that we're there to do. And isn't that right? Right. About, right. right. That's the truth. That, that's and it's the fun of it. I mean, it's why we, it's why why do we, why do you spend so much time on the video getting it so perfect? Why do we spend all this time agonizing over this stuff? So, it it's not that apparent until it needs until you butt up against a circumstance where it is apparent that you got a hail mary out of. You, your gear sur survives some heinous thing. That's the thing that I always like. And I didn't originate that. That's not like some big altruistic thing on my head. Hey, we're going to make the best stuff so that everybody has a wonderful life. And that wasn't anything like that. I had my high watt hundred. And when I finally started to get used to how it worked and being able to work it, I played that thing everywhere. And I parked my drink on top of it, just like every asshole guitar player that shouldn't do that did. And and um, I drank margaritas. I still do, but 
margaritas have the most sugar of m- most of the drinks, you know, right? Mm-hmm. And sugar, sugar, when it cooks at high voltage, turns to carbon, which is an electric conductor of electricity, and makes sure that things are going to short out inside mm-hmm. or drink inside an amp. And with my high watts, I could do a solo reach around and get my drink and hit the drink with the back of my hand and just slot, watch it in slow motion, tip over and gracefully empty its contents on top of the EL 34s. And the gorgeous, the lustrous, the angel's hair smoke would come rising out of the top and the power, the pilot light would just mercilessly flicker off. And I'd go, I can't finish my solo. We're going to take a short break. Yeah, yeah. Thank your waitresses. Yeah. Thank your bartenders. We'll be back in twenty minutes. And then I pull my amp apart out of the chassis, rush to the kitchen, and the kitchen's closed. But the guy, the janitor, is back there, and and in the kitchen, you know, they have the water hose with the trigger on it, so they can wash everything down in the floors and stuff. Can I use your? Can I use your water hose? He goes, "What for?" I said, "Just can I use it?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. And. um take the amp out of the chassis and just give it a hard blast of water inside. He goes, what the hell are you doing? I'm cleaning, I'm cleaning the drink out of my amp. And he goes, that ain't going to work anymore. And just. <laughs> and, uh, and then take it to the restroom and hit the thing that the, the, the dryer <laughs> holding the chassis into the dryer, dry it all out, bolt it all back together put it together and I've got a spare fuse in my toolbox and one of the power tubes b- cracked and another one shorted out when the one cracked. So I only had two power tubes left. So I took out the bad power tube, threw in the garbage, came back on stage with two power tubes left, set the impedance to eight ohms. I had a 16 ohm cabinet, fired it back up, played a couple of chords. Okay, we're good. Let's go. You know, oh, listen to the music, you know, <laughs> wimpy, wimpy songs are easy to play through a high watt because they don't put any strain on them. Right. So, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and the, the guys in the banner looked at me like, how did you do that? I just, it's not magic. <laughs> it's not magic. When you, when you, Drive yeah, but you, the, you had to have some semblance. Freeway, when you drive on the freeway and your your temperature gauge goes to the top, you know, okay, I got to get off the freeway. I got to get to do a gas station. I got to put water in my radiator, but I don't turn off the engine because I know that it'll freeze, that it'll seize if I turn the engine off when it's at its highest temperature and try to put cold water in the radiator. No, you keep the engine here. You keep the engine running. You get a rag and you take the radiator cap off and you put water in there and you get it. Cool I didn't and- know that. Now you know. Yeah. Because- because, yeah. because of the malcontents show about crazy psychopaths making tube amplifiers and talking about tube amplifiers for three effing hours. And I'm surprised that you guys right. are sticking, sticking ice picks in your ears and eyes at this moment. Because of all that and because of the wonderful video that you made and all the great work that you do as part of the team. And by the way, you said there was only five of us. There's actually seven and you're one of them. So you shouldn't, <laughs> like, you shouldn't talk down to yourself like that. But <laughs> because of all that, now you just learn when your radiator overheats, don't stop your engine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I learned the hard way. <laughs> but you know what, Steve? I think you should play us out. You got the ring. Grab the guitar. Let's hear some L roll. Twist my arm. Twist, I don't know. Twist my arm. All right, you guys. We're about to sign off. Thanks for hanging. I have to switch to uh, stereo mode, which is going to cause jokes. Yeah. So I'm Fine. done talking because I'm going to start to echo. Really obnoxious. But good night, you guys. Yeah, two I don't weeks. hear it. I don't hear it. I can't. I can. Thank <laughs> you.